this item on your checklist. It will store the checklist in your subconscious. It's encoded in your RAS and your mind is now on the alert to spot things related to it. The way that you make yourself feel like something is important is your nervous system goes on alert while you're thinking about it. You're either super excited about something, oh, this is super important, or this is the trauma effect. You go on alert and you have something really bad happen, which is why things continue to bring it up throughout the rest of your life. So when you understand that if something's important to you, your filter will change in real time how you see the fucking world. You now know how to change your brain to work for you. And looking for hearts is the way I'm gonna to prove to you that this happens. I wanna give you one other example because everybody's experienced this. If you've ever gone shopping for a new car or you've dreamt about having a new car, what happens immediately when you get excited about that new car is your mind goes, Zygon artifact, oops, okay, Tom wants the new Bronco. That's cool. So what do you see now? You see Broncos everywhere. Now they were always there, but your mind is letting them in because the Zygon artifact is now made it on a checklist. It's changed the RAS. And so I am going to prove to you that it is unbelievably cool that you can change the way that you view the world by looking for heart-shaped objects. So tomorrow when you wake up, you're gonna start your day by high-fiving yourself in the mirror. I want you to examine what the resistance about because you're gonna to start to then un be able to unpack what's holding you back. Then you're gonna go out in the world and just like tell your mind, I wanna see a heart today. Look for a rock, look for a leaf, look in your like latte, is there a little shape there? Is there an oil stain on the floor? And when you see one, stop and go, shit, I, I just, I, like there's a scavenger hunt. I, I never would have seen that before. Thank you, brain. Now your brain's like, Ooh, more hearts. You will start to see hearts everywhere. And when you can start to train your brain and realize, whoa, this is actually a cool thing. This is high-fiving your mind. Mm -hmm. When you can see hearts, you can now go, wait a minute. If I can change what I see based on what I tell it, maybe if I got serious about not constantly saying I'm a failure, I wouldn't attach that or see it everywhere. Maybe if I got serious about saying I can figure anything out, this is happening for a reason instead of I'm fucked. You say, okay, I'm gonna learn something with this. It changes the way your brain filters everything. And this is such an important piece to the book because we've all had the experience where you love somebody deeply and you see all their incredible attributes and all they see is failure or all they see is the weight that they can't lose. And it doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter what kind of pep talk or support you give them your loved one still only sees what they hate about themselves. Blame the filter in your brain. You have been bitching about your appearance or the weight on your scale, the fact that you're a failure for so long, your brain believes it's important to you to see reasons why this is true. And one of the things I gotta say about this and everything in the book is the tools are simple, Tom, but it's super important to say just because you change and start celebrating yourself, it's not gonna make the weight disappear suddenly. It doesn't change the number on the scale overnight. What it changes is you. And that changes your ability to deal with the problems and the issues you wanna change in your life. You have some really uh, counterintuitive ideas, bold stances on things, which I found incredibly interesting. One of them is jealousy. <laughs> and that not to just reject that stuff offhand, but that there's actually information carried in those strong emotions. Jealousy is one of the most powerful directional signals on the planet because you're only jealous of people that are doing things or have things that you actually want. It's impossible to be fake jealous. Whatever you're jealous of is hitting something deeply personal. Fucking pay attention to it. Instead of stewing in it, go, oh, flip it. That's interesting. I wonder why I'm jealous. What is it about it? Oh, 
it's that they're doing it consistently. It's that they've built a team. It's that they've aligned their work together so that they're spending more time together. Huh, how could I take those things that I'm really now really inspired by and take action and go get them in my life? Because the thing about jealousy is it's just your inspiration that's blocked. Jealousy is sort of the insecurity that you have that blocks this inspiration. I guarantee you, back to the Uber driver, he's jealous of all the other actors earning Oscars because he's so inspired by the thought of doing that in his own life, but his insecurity is blocking action. His fear is blocking action. So instead of it being inspiration, it shows up as jealousy. And I'm here to tell you, the second you feel jealousy, frickin' whoop, stop, okay, let's unpack that. What exactly is it about it? And now, if I were inspired by it, because there's enough success to go around for everybody, if I can use that as a roadmap to then go figure out how I might be able to do that for myself, wow, talk about a game changer. And now let's add in the high five. What if every time I took a little step, I celebrated myself for just doing it? Now you're building small wins and momentum in a direction that's meant for you. That's how you change your life. Yeah, that to me, getting people to understand that the idea that there's enough success for anybody, it doesn't matter if you're copying somebody for no reason other than the only thing that matters in life is are you having fun? Is this a joyful life? Are you working hard at something that matters to you? Yeah. And whether or not it's even a carbon copy of somebody else, if you're having a ball, you've already won. Totally. And getting people to recognize, like, and this is why I like your answer around, at some point you just have to accept you're high-fiving yourself in the mirror because the neurochemistry says that that's what you need to do. Getting people to understand neurochemistry is the game. Yeah. And once you understand the game that you're playing, then you can play it well. But if you don't understand the game, then you're gonna get stuck and you're gonna be stuck forever. And you talk a lot about taking responsibility for that, recognizing nobody's coming to save you. It's something you said in the book, it's something that you've said in interviews, it's something that I absolutely think is really powerful. How do we use that? Why is that important to recognize? Well, it's important to recognize because first of all, nobody is coming. <laughs> I mean, if you've been sitting around waiting for somebody to discover you, to pick you, to save you, to rescue you, to give you your shot, it's not fucking happening. Like, at some point, you got to wake up and realize when you're 18 and you're out of that house, you have to parent yourself. Your life is your responsibility. And as a woman, one of the things that I found to be extraordinarily transformational is when I stopped, in a very traditional sense, looking to my partner to be responsible yeah, for so providing for me, providing financially, providing the support, providing when I realized, wait a minute, it starts with me. I have to be able to figure out how to make myself happy. That's by the way, the secret to a happy relationship, marry somebody who's happy and work on your own happiness. Preach. And so when you stop outsourcing your happiness, your validation, your support, all of it, and you bring it back in and you get responsible for it, it sounds scary. It's so liberating because you could do anything. When you're responsible, when you're the driver of your life, when you're not looking out to anybody else to fix it for you, can you ask for help? Of course but the buck stops with you. Mm. You're the one that has to do the work. You're the one who has to push your own ass. You're the one who has to figure out what makes you happy. You're the one who has to figure out and become self-aware about what you need. And then you're the one that has to find whatever it is, the courage or being humble enough to ask for help. Even if it's asking for help from the biggest ally that you have, which is the person staring back at you in the mirror every damn morning. Yeah, I don't know why people aren't more obsessed with their goals. It's like, if my goals demand that I ask for help, then I'm going to ask for help. Like, I'm not even going to let anything else get in the way. I'm just so obsessed with, if my goal is exciting and honorable, then I should actually want to achieve it, and huh. therefore, whatever it is that I need to do. So, Tom, this is why. And this comes back to what makes has made me really sad and deeply moved by the kinds of things that people are sharing. 
Most people aren't obsessed with their goals because they don't believe they're worthy of them. It's easy to dream about what you want, but in between where you are and what you want, there's a tremendous amount of stuff you got to change and do. And if you have a lot of trauma in your background or you were raised by somebody who beat the shit out of you or told you were a piece of shit, or if you've had to deal with microaggressions or racist, discriminatory, systematic crap your entire life, you have been given the message over and over and over, even though it's not true, that you don't deserve it, that there's something wrong with you. And if you don't at some point be defiant against what the world or your caregivers or your past experience has pounded into your brain incorrectly, unfairly, you will forever be stuck with that story. You are not responsible for what happened to you. You survived what happened to you, but you do have a responsibility to heal yourself and to do the work to change so that you can be the happy, fulfilled person that you were born to be. Yeah, that's really powerful because it's the only thing that works. And, mm -hmm. you know, thinking about so many people have just immense things that have happened that have been unfair. And as you said, they didn't do anything to deserve it. But now what? Now you're there, you've got the trauma, and no one can heal it for you. It's, there's a name for it. It's, I think it's called the pedestrian problem. It's like imagine that you get hit by a car mm. and the driver was drunk. And let's say that the driver was Bill Gates. And let's say that um, you win a settlement. But if the damage that happened to your body can't be fixed with all the money in the world, and you just have to do physical therapy, then it's like, even though it is unfair that you have to do the physical therapy, you, there is no amount of money that you can throw at it that will stop you from having to suffer to build yourself back up. And I think a lot of people either fall prey to trap number one, which is they don't think they're worthy, or they fall prey to trap number two, which is it's so unfair they just don't take action. Right. But they're nonetheless in the situation that they're in, and if the whole punchline to life is neurochemistry and feeling joyful and you know, being um, excited about who you are when you're by yourself, then it's like, well, you have to do the work even if it isn't fair. And that to especially me- Especially if it isn't. Why Because especially? there's two kinds of prisons that you can sentence yourself to or be sentenced to, right? One is all the physical shit you're talking about. The circumstances of your life, the circumstances of your body, the circumstances that are unfair, and then there is the mental prison, and that's the one you're in control of. So people can do all kinds of shit to you, and you can be born into situations that are not uh, fair, they're not safe, they're cruel, it's unfair, you didn't deserve it, but the real power that you always have is how you react to it mentally. I'm not saying put lipstick on a pig and ignore the very real problems you're saying, you're, you're facing. I'm saying it begins with your mental attitude about your own ability to face it and to survive it and to move past it. That's what I'm saying. Because mm. without that, like let's go back to the woman in the domestic violence shelter who's had the shit beaten out of her by partners who has immense emotional trauma stored in her nervous system, stored in the neurochemistry of her brain. She has a extraordinary amount of hurdles to get through in her life to heal, to be safe, to break patterns that are associated with the trauma that she's experienced as a child, the trauma that she experienced in romantic relationships, the physical abuse. She has issues related to poverty. Can a human being survive those things and change? Of course they can. It begins though with the belief that you can. And so when I come back to this moment every single morning, you can have nothing and you can still have your own back. You can have tremendous problems and very real obstacles that you're facing. And you can have a mindset that says through my efforts, my attitude, I can have an impact on the situation that I'm in. That's the power that I have. Mm -hmm.
I can ask for help because I believe I deserve it. I can seek therapy because I believe I should heal because I deserve that. I can seek information from shows like Impact Theory about how to break trauma patterns, about how to regulate my nervous system, because I believe I am worthy of that. When I raise my hand in the mirror, I'm basically saying, fuck off to these people that hurt me because I believe that I deserve better. That's where it begins. It begins with you. Self-confidence, self-love, self-esteem, self-reliance, self-awareness. It all has the same self. You have to give yourself those things. You want validation? Give it to yourself. You want to be cheered for? Give it to yourself. You want to feel supported in life? Start by giving those things to yourself because the most important relationship that you have is the one you have with yourself and you work on it the least. It's the foundation of every relationship you have. And so I believe that there are simple things you can do from looking at hearts, which doesn't solve your problems. It proves to you that it's possible to change the way your brain works. That's why I want you to do it. It's not going to take away poverty. It's not going to make you lose a hundred pounds. It's going to prove to you that shit, you do have power over the way your mind works. And when you get crafty about training your brain, you can do really cool shit. And when your attitude is optimistic, based on research, we know that you will work harder and keep going because you believe that it makes a difference. It begins with these simple things. Do it anyway is a mindset trick that you can use when you start to feel excuses rolling up. It works a lot like the five second rule. So you have said to yourself, okay, I'm gonna talk to my boss today about that thing that I've been avoiding talking to them about. Or maybe you've said something like, I'm gonna to go to the gym today or tomorrow or whatever. And then the moment comes where you've gotta have that conversation. Or the moment comes where it's time to pack up your bag and leave your desk and go to the gym. And what always happens? You don't feel like it. I bet there are plenty of you watching that have made a commitment that, nah, I'm not gonna have a drink tonight. And then guess what happens when you get home? You don't feel like not drinking. You feel like having a drink. And so here's what do it anyway has done for me. The idea that I just do it anyway has pushed me to realize and to recognize that there are a lot of moments where there are things in my life that I really want to do, I need to do, I should do, but when the moment comes, I don't feel like it. And so I pull out this idea of, you know what? I'm just going to do it anyway. It's raining outside. I said I would go for a, a short run. I don't feel like it. I'm going to do it anyway. It's six o'clock in the morning. I'm tired. It's cold. I laid out my yoga clothes, but now I don't feel like it. What do I do? I do it anyway. When you start to say to yourself, I'm going to do it anyway, what happens is something really cool. You acknowledge that there are feelings that you have that are trying to swoop in and hijack you. You acknowledge them and you basically say, guess what? I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> so how do you make a big decision, right? So it's a decision that sounds like he's going to accept a new job, but it requires him to move to another state. And notice what he said. I want it but I'm afraid. This is the perfect question for right now because you would actually use do it anyway. You see, the thing about the way to make decisions, this is my decision-making tool. I don't think we haven't covered it yet in this, but for those of you that have followed me for a while, you know that I have this decision-making tool. In fact, we talked about it in the journaling method. So you know in the journaling method, if you go back to uh, videos 9, 10, and 11, and if you look at the journaling method that we um, talked to you about, and look, I want to tell you something. I'm not, ex I'm not asking you to buy this. In fact, please don't buy the five-second journal. We don't have any more in stock. They're sold out around the globe. We'll print more. I'm, do not buy this. I'm not doing this uh, training to ask you to buy anything. I'm showing you this because for those of you that don't have the journaling method in front of you, if you go to uh, fivesecondjournal.com, 5secondjournal.com. If you go to 5secondjournal.com, 
what you will find is a ton of free templates that will show you the journaling method for free. You don't ever have to buy that. I'm telling you not to buy it. I want to be very clear. The reason why we're doing these trainings is not to get you to buy something, okay? It's to help you learn how to reset your mind. So back to the question. The opening thing in the journal. Do I have one that's open here? Because then I can hold, well, I'll just open this one. The opening thing in the journal is a fuel gauge that has you tune in, and this is going to get to decision making, that has you tune in to how you are feeling energy-wise every morning. And so let me show you what that looks like in case you haven't seen those videos yet. So you see this little fuel gauge right here. Oh, can you see it on Instagram, Oak? Am I holding it up? Yeah, just oh. like not that one. Yeah, there you go. You okay, see it really there well. you go. So that fuel gauge is uh, a visual cue to have you tune into your energy and to assess whether or not you are depleted and empty about something and heavy or the other um, extreme is energized, full, um, expanded, uh, open to possibility. And the reason why I ask you to do that first thing in the morning to assess your mood to access your energy, to tune in, is because there's established research that says that your mood in your morning impacts your productivity and focus all day long. And so if you can boost your mood in the morning, it has a material impact on your focus and on your uh, productivity all day. And so we use it in the morning in the journaling method that I've taught you in videos 9 through 11. But when it comes to decisions, I want you to do the exact same thing. I get that you're scared. It's a change. I would be kind of surprised if you weren't a little nervous about doing something awesome, like moving to a new state and uh, starting a, a new job and all the possibilities that come in with it. So if you're trying to make a decision, do I do this thing that's scary or not? What you do is tune inward and really assess how do you feel about it? When you think about yourself living in this new place and having this new job and all the possibility and growth that comes with it, do you feel dead and depleted and stuck? Or do you feel energized and alive and full of possibility? You see, if the decision is something that will expand your future, that will create possibility, that will make you um, grow, then it is a thousand percent something that you must do. And you must do it even though you're afraid. And the fear is a very normal thing. And the fear is there because you're about to do something new. But do not use the fear to talk yourself out of making a decision that actually is grounded in growth and possibility and energizing you. So that's how I make decisions using the stuff that you're learning in the Mindset Reset. And again, you can go back to the journaling method on videos 9, 10, and 11. But if you have a big decision to make and you notice that you're afraid or you notice that you're stuck up here, go in. Go in and ask yourself, does the decision deplete me, make me stuck, make me feel dead, make me feel heavy? Or does the decision, even though it scares me, even though it's hard, is there something about it that expands possibility and opens up my life and, and will give me an opportunity to grow? If you're in this camp, the answer is heck yes. If you're in the dead camp and the duh, hell no. Because the do it anyway thing, I do it every morning. Because here's the deal about me, you guys. I hate exercising. I hate it. Yeah, you do. I, yeah, I do. I hate it. But I, actually, I should say it this way. I hate going. I hate getting dressed for it. I hate driving there, but I love how I feel when I've done it. I love it. And so do it anyway has helped me get through the front resistance, the part that I hate. And it helps me get there. And once I'm there, I absolutely don't necessarily love the exercise, but when I'm done, I love how I feel. And so that's how I use do it anyway, okay? Every day I use do it anyway because it works so powerfully for me to push my excuses aside and to actually take care of my body, which is a very important thing in terms of my commitment, in terms of my desire to really enjoy my life fully, 
But I never, ever, ever, I'm never the kind of person that wakes up and goes, yeah, let's go exercise. I'm never the kind of person that is driving there going, I'm so excited to do this. I'm never the kind of person walking in that's even like, yes, I'm so glad I made it. I dread it usually all the way through it. Um, sometimes I half enjoy it while I'm there, but mostly I dread it. But by the time it's over, I frigging love the fact that I went and that's why I do it. And so I cannot wait to bring on fitness coach, Peter, who is losing his motivation over in Ireland. So let's see what he has to say right now. Hello there, Mel, team and the phenomenal community. I'll stay connected. Um, my name is Peter and I'm dining in from the Republic of Ireland. And I've got this question based on today's uh, live stream topic, uh, positivity. Uh, I'm a fitness coach and I feel like I've been inspiring, motivating, teaching how to deal with different obstacles, um, my clients, my family. But on most days, especially now, I am feeling I'm losing the ground under my own feet and I'm struggling with finding um, that constant flow mm. of positivity. So my question is, how can I find that balance uh, within my own so thanks very much um, for everything you do. Stay blessed, stay well. Thank you again. All right, so there were a couple things about the question. First of all, Peter, thank you so much for sending your question all the way from Ireland. And you said a couple things that jumped out of you. You uh, are losing the ground underneath you and you are seeking advice about how to stay motivated consistently. So here's what I want to do. I want to put this in the language that you as a fitness coach will certainly appreciate, but you watching, this is for you too. You're training for this moment. And Peter in particular, somebody who has been motivating people, who has been training people to be physically fit. You have been training for this moment your entire life. And you got to view this moment like a test. And what is the test testing? It's testing who you are. That's part of the race right now, how you show up for it, right? It's not a matter of how you finish it. It's how you show up for it and what you do while you're running it, the kind of racer that you are. And look, I get it. This is a very difficult race that we're all running because we don't know where the finish line is. And it is very, very hard to stay motivated, which is the advice that you're seeking, Peter, when you don't even know when this damn thing is ending. This is the part of the race. I've run four marathons. Don't everybody gasp. I mean, it was nothing to uh, to brag about. I mean, I finished them, which is which is something to brag about, but it's not like I won the damn thing. But this is the point in time when you're running a race, when you said you're losing ground. What that means is you're starting to slow down you feel your legs getting heavier. You feel your breath getting a little bit more shallow. You start to wonder, oh shit, I, I, why did I sign up for this thing in the first place? You start to wonder if you are going to make it. And so here's what I'm gonna tell you, Peter. When you are coaching your clients and your clients start to lose ground, when you are coaching your clients and your clients don't feel motivated and they feel tired and they feel like giving up and they don't wanna do another set of burpees, what do you tell them? You tell them to dig deeper. You tell them to find the strength within them to keep going. You see what you need right now is you need to start building the motivation of your mind because motivation doesn't exist in your body it comes from up here. And what I hear is that you now have an opportunity. This is what the test is, Peter, to train harder because you are capable of so much more. This is handing you a moment where you get to become an even stronger and more capable version of yourself. Now, does that mean that you're gonna be motivated all day long uh, every single day that you wake up? No, 
but it means you've got to have the mental fitness right now to continue to get up, to show up, and to dig deeper when it comes to your mindset, when it comes to your attitude, when it comes to your just knowing that you are going to get through this. And so this moment, everybody, it's telling you who you are. It's telling you whether or not you're the kind of person that shows up to a challenge and you're pissed off or you're sad or you feel depressed or you feel despair or you feel all of these things that start to take you down the drain of negativity. And what I'm here to tell you is that you are built for this moment. You may not feel like it. You may feel sad. Those are all normal feelings. You may feel negative. It's very easy to do. You may start to feel a little bit of despair. That's going to come and go. But this is where the test of this race that we're currently running lies. When those feelings rise up and you start losing ground and you start feeling like you're not going to make it to the finish line and you start feeling unmotivated, can you dig deeper and remind yourself that you were built for this moment? Because one of the things that I know is that when the shit is hitting the fan, I guarantee you there are people in your life that are looking to you. There are people in your life, whether it's clients or colleagues or family members that are looking to you right now. You know what that tells me? That you're the kind of person that people rely on. And now is the moment in time in the race that we're all running where you got to teach yourself to rely on yourself. How do you do that? How do you build the muscle of the mind? It's very simple. Very simple. I didn't say easy. I said simple. The steps are very simple. To win this race and to build strength in this muscle right up here, you got to focus on the shit you can control. And that is what you do with your body and what you do with your mind. And the one thing that has made a huge difference in me, because you can see that I am showing up as a very different Mel Robbins than I've been the last couple of weeks. The last couple of weeks, I have been losing the race. I've been going up and down. I've been doing my best to stay positive, but I am now back in the race. I have now found my ground and found my footing. And it comes in focusing on what you can control. And you know what you can control? There's only one thing. It's what are you doing to make this day, the best day that you can do. What are you doing to master this day today? Fuck tomorrow. Forget about next week. Forget about what's happening this summer. This is a race that will be won by those of you who are the ability to focus on today and making today amazing. And so you know what I did today? Today, I did something I haven't done since the beginning of this quarantine. I got up an hour earlier than I normally do. Why? Well, because I noticed that throughout my day, I was feeling behind. Throughout my day, even though I was waking up, even though I have a morning routine, even though I was getting stuff done, I felt, even though I was doing all those things somehow behind. And I realized that in order to master my day, in order to be fully in control of what I'm going to do today, I got to make sure that when my ass hits this chair at 9 a.m. and my workday starts, I have fully taken control of everything that puts my body and my mind first. And when I was honest with myself, about why I was losing ground and why I wasn't feeling motivated and why I was starting to feel my own energy cycle down. It was because I was not taking the time in the morning to give myself the mental prep and training and the physical prep and training so that I could make this day, today, April 14th with everything that I got. And so that's what you need to do. And that's what, Peter, you need to do, too, over there in Ireland. You need to remind yourself of who you are. You are a person who has been training for this moment your entire life. This is a race where you do not see the finish line, which means you have got to focus on today. You have got to focus on what you can control. And the only thing we can control is what our body is doing today and what we allow our minds to focus on. 
So the second your mind starts to go down that drain of, oh my God, what's going to happen? And, da, 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 and this fall, and when's it going to end? And blah, 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 do, 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 do. And you feel yourself losing motivation and losing ground. We are done mourning this situation. We are done feeling sad about this situation. How about we give ourselves a collective bitch slap? We dig a little bit deeper and we show up for this situation. What else are you going to do? Feel sorry for yourself, lick your wounds. It's so much better when you decide to dig deep and you decide to show up. That's what I'm gonna do. Um, some days it's gonna be harder than others, but that's the whole point of getting stronger. Reminding yourself that you are capable of so much more and all of the emotions that you're feeling and all of the excuses that you're feeling, it's all normal, but it's a choice as to whether or not you listen to them. So Peter, Keep me posted on how you're doing. And for you watching this, I hope that this gives you the kick in the ass that you need to shake that negativity loose and to rise to this moment and start working on the things that you can control, your mind and your body. And in case nobody else tells you today, I'm gonna tell you, I love you, I believe in you. I don't care how tired you are. I don't care how sad you are. I don't care how overwhelmed you are. Get your shit together because this is the new reality. And you can make today a better day by focusing on what you can control. And I'm going to be here every day, annoying, as positive as I can be, to push you to remember that. And if you're wondering, how the hell do I get on this and get this motivation from Mel and ask her a question and get the tough love that I need and seize the opportunity in this moment, just text your question. See the phone number below? That is our texting community. Get yourself on it. Ask a question. When you text it, there will be something that comes back to you. You got to reply in order to opt in. Ask the question. That way my team can reach out to you. You could find yourself on a future video. How about that? All right. You go have a great day and dig a little deeper today. It's really an interesting trick of the mind. And like you, I have this similar sense of, I want to be able to want it for people. Yeah. And the one thing in my life that I am very grateful for is that I know how to build desire. I know how to go down the process of wanting something. What, what is that process for you of desire? Because most, what I found in this book is here's the thing for most people, and I'm hoping that your process will attack this. What I've discovered that is heartbreaking is the average person cannot celebrate themselves, cannot. I'm going to ask everybody who's watching this to tomorrow morning, stand in front of the mirror. We're going to unpack this whole thing and try to high five yourself. And most really people, fast. Give people the, the science behind why that's meaningful. So I have this habit of every single morning I stand in front of the mirror and I take a moment and I raise my hand and I give my reflection a high five. And there is so much science behind this. So instead of seeing yourself, right, and have, having this moment in the mirror, you know what the average person does? First of all, we beat ourselves down. So I would look in the mirror for 40 some years and be like, oh my God, my freaking jowls look like saddlebags on a goddamn horse going in the Grand Canyon. My eyes have a, my neck is only striped, my boob, one boob's hanging lower than the other. I look like shit, my gray hair. Like I start bringing myself down. And when you start going down that road with your reflection, then your thoughts go to, I didn't get to that email. I forgot to text Lisa back. I, oh my gosh, the dog still needs to be walked. I've got nine minutes for my first Zoom call. You're now checking out. And that moment in the mirror every morning could be a profound moment where you lift yourself up and you check back in with your intention. So the first piece of research, and this is recent from Harvard Business School, is that a simple moment in the morning where you set an intention about who you're going to be today impacts productivity, how you show up as a leader, it impacts your confidence, it impacts your mood all day long, just that simple moment of setting an intention. So that's research number one. Instead of standing in front of the sink in your bathroom and criticizing your appearance or mindlessly going on autopilot, check back in 
and let's teach you to ha make it a habit to lift yourself back up. Second piece of research, and this comes from a whole field of study called neurobics. Neurobics is like aerobics for your mind. I didn't make this up. This is literally, you can speed up the development of new neural pathways by marrying physical activity with a change in thought. And so traditionally, I know you've covered this on your show, if you, for example, were to brush your teeth, I'm a right-hander, if you were to brush it with your other hand and think uh, a new thought, the fact that your brain is focusing on brushing with your non-dominant hand activates more focus on the new thought, it accelerates the learning. So you take neurobics, a physical activity with a different thought, and let me, let's talk about a high five, for example. What does a high five mean to you? That somebody did something awesome or I did something awesome. Correct. And if you think about the times in your life when you've gotten a high five, it's because somebody's like, Tom, you're amazing. Tom, get your attitude out of the can. You got this. Tom, you're going to make this shot. Tom, we can still win. I believe in you. Keep going. You have a lifetime positive association with giving other people high fives stored right here in your subconscious mind. When you raise your hand to your own reflection, it is impossible for you to think, God, I look fat. Boy, <laughs> am I an asshole. I really screwed up my life. You can't do it because your lifetime association with this motion is all, I believe in you, I got you, I see you, I celebrate you. And so you, in the moment of doing it, override decades of negative self-talk. It's incredible. Now, have you ever gotten a high five where somebody misses the hand or it's sort of like, it sucks, of right? Of course, yeah. Yeah, what do you do when that happens? I redo it. Correct. Yeah. That's because a high five requires you to be present and there is an intention behind it. So you can't raise your hand to your own reflection without now grounding yourself in the moment. That's just the beginning of the research. I can go on about the NBA. And Dude, the, that, okay. that was my favorite part. Hearing about the NBA, like even now it's giving me chills. Like, and especially because we're recording this still as everybody thought we were getting out of the pandemic and now we've got the, the variant. Now even I'm starting to worry about the lack of physical contact and yeah. just like this, the, the cues that we give each other through yeah. touch like that. So yeah, yeah th this was one of my favorite parts of the book. Yeah, the oh, I love this research too because you know what happened with the high five is look, I did this on a low moment for myself. Like, so my brand of self-help is Mel's life is kind of <laughs> fucked up at the moment and she can't figure out how to help herself. So she stumbles by accident on something really stupid on its face and it feels good. And then I share it with my audience and if they pick up on it and they, then I'm like, okay, we're on to something. So for me, the high five Tom began, I'm fired from my talk show, my book contract is canceled, every speech has been canceled. My kids are now home, so we've got three kids, 22, 20, uh, age 15, all in varying states of distress. I am triggered because my origin story, as you know from being on the show and us being friends, the five second rule was 12 years ago, losing everything. And so I'm now having this feeling like I'm about to lose everything. And I'm also feeling like I'm losing grip on reality as the pandemic is hitting and as my kids are in distress. And I don't know what to do, just like everybody on the planet. I find myself in my bathroom one morning in my underwear and I am having this spiral of negative thoughts. I look like shit. I don't know how to fix this. I wish somebody would solve this for me. I feel overwhelmed. I feel scared about my parents' health. I feel scared about everybody on the front lines. And even though I'm literally like you, somebody that empowers other people, I didn't know what the fuck to say to myself. And as pathetic as it sounds, I found myself just raising my hand, just in a way to basically be like, shut up, Mel, come on, girl. You, like, put your shoulders back, lift your chest. You, you got this. You can do this. And something shifted and I went on with my day. And then the next morning I walk into my bathroom and this is the other weird thing about the high five. I've literally either criticized myself or ignored myself in the mirror for decades. When you start to have a moment with yourself, the crazy part is you start to build a partnership with yourself. That's interesting. Like 
You know, when you are pulling out of your driveway or you're walking down the street and you see a neighbor and they greet you, you will start to have that experience when you create this intentional moment with yourself in the mirror every morning. And so as I started to do this, I thought this is actually making me feel like the wind is at my back when I leave the bathroom. It's making me feel just like when you leave a huddle in sports and you high five or you're a runner running a race or doing some big endurance challenge and some spectator high fives you or another racer is like, come on, you got this as you're dragging down low. It gives you a little energy. Like I think too about this high five a lot. Like I know we're, you know, you're friends with David Goggins. I'm a huge fan of Goggins. And so, and I know there's a lot of people that watch this show, especially men that are like, this sounds kind of stupid. This is the equivalent of Goggins cookie jar moment. So we all think like we've all been raised like tough love, hard on myself, this bullshit. The research is clear on this. Being hard on yourself is not fucking motivating. It's demotivating. And if you already feel like a failure or you feel a sense of shame or you're overwhelmed, beating yourself up for where you are does not fucking work. It drives you into the gutter. The most motivating force in the world on the planet based on research hands down is empowerment, encouragement, support, and celebration. And for our entire lives, we have outsourced that to somebody else. The research is very clear. So the NBA study, they did this big study looking at NBA teams. And they could predict in the study who was going to be in the championship rounds based on, in the preseason, what teams had the most high fives, fist bumps, and back pats. Why? Because those kind of gestures create partnership and trust. And I'm here to tell you, when you start doing it in the mirror, you're creating partnership and trust with yourself. And so, you know, one of the things that I love about this is that in a moment when you feel alone, you can give yourself the boost, the support, the empowerment that you need to keep going. And here's another piece of research that's also like, holy cow, you're a big proponent of the growth mindset. You guys talk about it all the time on this show, right? So researchers wanted to know, what is the most empowering way to motivate kids through a really big challenge, okay? They divide the kids into three groups. This takes the marshmallow test to a whole nother level. You got one group of kids that are doing a challenging task and they're getting the fixed mindset praise, which we all know does not work. Oh, Tom, you're so smart. Oh, Tom, I love your glasses. That's going to help you. Oh, Tom, you got a great smile. Oh, Tom, you know, I, I just love so much about you. I know you can do this. So that's one group. The second group gets the growth mindset kind of praise. Tom, you are such a hard worker. Tom, your perseverance is unbelievable. Tom, you just keep going. That does better, obviously, than telling you that you're smart because it makes you motivated to work hard. The third group, they just got a simple high five. The researchers didn't even say anything to the kids. They just walked up, gave them a high five. The group of kids that got a simple high five outperformed outworked through all of the challenges, all of the other forms of praise. Why? Because a high five is something deeper than praise. It fulfills your most fundamental needs as a human being. When somebody high fives you, you feel seen, you feel heard, and you feel like somebody has acknowledged you for the unique person that you are. Let's just talk for a second about the things that go viral. You can always find going viral a teacher standing outside of a classroom doing what? Greeting kids with individual handshakes. And we see that and we're like, oh, that's amazing. Why? Because every one of those kids before they walk into the classroom feels seen, they feel heard, and they feel acknowledged for the unique individual that they are all through a simple handshake or high five. And one of the reasons why I'm so excited about this is because in starting to just kind of put it out there very casually uh, on the story, you know, in the very beginning, because I've been researching this now for a year, um, I started to get back all of the objections that people had to doing it. And they're fucking sad, Tom. And this gets to the heart of why I think so many people are stuck. One of the biggest objections that people had to 
standing in front of the mirror, take a moment, look at yourself, and then raise your hand. As people said over and over and over again, I haven't done anything worthy of high-fiving. High-fiving feels like a celebration. I don't have the number on the scale that I want. I don't like my bank account. I don't enjoy what I do for a living. I've made a shitload of mistakes. I'm struggling with trauma. I don't have anything to celebrate. And what I realized is people are making a fundamental mistake. You are withholding the very support, empowerment, and celebration that you need to change and to do the hard work and to face the things that you're scared of. And that's why you're not changing. This is so interesting. So I'm going to push you on this. I'm super curious because one of the things I love about you is you're so blunt and Mm -hmm. honest about, hey, if you want to have self-worth, you have to do things you think are worthy. I'm a huge proponent of that. And yet I do recognize that you have to let yourself off the hook to really get started. So how do you help people anchor on something? Is it just, hey, it's the fucking neurochemistry of the situation. You have to do it. Yeah, pretty much. Because if you can't stand in front of the mirror and raise your hand and high five yourself just because you got your ass out of bed and you're breathing, you will never get what you want in life, ever. There is something in the resistance to it. And if you unpack the resistance, you will find the reason why you don't have what you want. You either think you're not worthy of it or you think that it's kind of stupid or you have been brought up to believe that for for women in particular, you're gonna be bitchy or selfish or not likable if you're celebrating yourself. There is something in the resistance to you simply cheering for yourself. So talk to the person though that, so as of right now, they they really believe the world has shown them that they aren't worthy. It's not like they question it, they know it to be true. Yeah. How do you help people, because I recognize that as a lie, or even if it's true, right. it's useless, right. but how do you help people out of that moment? So the first thing that I would say is, how is treating yourself as if you're unworthy helping you? Like, let's just get strategic and common sense about it. Is the negative shit you're saying and the support that you're withholding helping you feel better? If it's not, try this. Try celebrating yourself five days in a row. Literally, try starting your day by waking up and raising your hand and high-fiving yourself in the mirror just because you're breathing and see what happens. Uh, We have a, a, a woman that wrote to us who's in a domestic violence shelter. Oof. She's lost everything. She's been in abusive relationships. She has a tremendous amount of childhood trauma. She is doing the high five habit and here's what she had to say about it. I have nothing right now. I have a tremendous amount of evidence from my life that I have fucked everything up. But you know what this high five habit is showing me? I still have me. I can have my own back. I can be here for myself. The world has told me and convinced me that I can't, but every morning when I stand here and I stare at myself in the mirror and I raise my hand in defiance of all the shit that's happened to me, I keep going. I am saying I believe in myself. And when you have that small reversal, that small act of defiance, and that's what it is. If you're like heavy and you're eating emotionally or you're feeding your trauma, when you raise your hand and celebrate yourself, even though you don't like what you look like, it's an act of fucking defiance to all the stuff that you have survived in your life. And the best part about it, you don't have to fucking say anything. And you know, the reason why this is so important is most mantras are complete bullshit because you don't believe it. You know, it's a, there's a, we all know we need to accept ourselves. We all know we need to love ourselves, but how, how do you do it to your point when you have a bunch of evidence stacked up that you've failed or reasons that you see that make you feel like you've blown it or you're not worthy of it? I'll tell you how you freaking raise your hand and high five yourself anyway, because beating yourself up will not make you do the work to get healthy. And tearing yourself down over the shit that you've done or the terrible relationships that you're in, it's not going to empower you to change the patterns that are keeping you stuck. But raising your hand in an act of defiance or a 
due to the past that you survived and saying, I'm still here, which means I still have a shot to change my life. That is what this means. I've only recently kind of stumbled into, as I've been digging into more research around the science of confidence and the skill of confidence, because a lot of people think that confidence is a personality trait. It's not. It's actually a skill that you build through action. And a lot of people think confidence is a state of belief. It can be, mm -hmm. but that's not where it begins. And so I say that confidence is the willingness to try. That's all that it is. Knowing that you may succeed or survive, but you'll still try. And to me, all those people that we admire most, that's what they're doing. They have the ability to tune into those instincts mm -hmm. that are true for them. Because the fact is, there's only one you. That's it. And you matter because there's only one you and there's only ever going to be one you. And your instincts and your experiences and your inner wisdom is a gift to the world. And every time that you tune it out because of the habit of hesitating or the habit of self-doubt or the habit of worrying or the habit of overthinking, you are robbing the world of that gift that you have to, to give to everybody. Mm -hmm. And you can use this simple, stupid, silly tool to train yourself to not only hear it, but also to develop the skill of courage to act on it. Mm, powerful. And is there any area of your life where you feel like you lack courage still? Um, you know, I'll admit it's kind of easy. I think we all kind of go through those, those moments where you feel like you're behind. And I think social media is both an incredible tool and it can also be um, one of those triggers that makes you feel like, Look at how many followers this guy has. And like, I'm, I'm like so tiny compared to this guy right here. Like it's easy to right. use technology and social media, not for inspiration, mm -hmm. but actually as a way to bash yourself that you're not doing what yeah, other people are doing. Or whatever. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And so I think that I, I, use the rule a lot for patience. I noticed that my insecurity rises up because right now, you know, look, I, I did a ridiculous number of speeches last year. I travel way too much. Mm. I don't want my life to look like that. Um, it's a champagne problem. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I also have three kids in a marriage that I love and I really feel depleted when I'm not with them. And yeah. so I'm practicing patience as I make an intentional pivot in the kind of business that I'm running so that I have more of a life that I want as yeah, well. Yeah. So that's one area. Um, you know, I, I, I don't feel insecure as much as, you know, you know the term deliberate practice, right? Mm -hmm. And you know the five-hour rule. where deliberate practice, is that from the talent code? Well, the deliberate practice is actually a psychological principle. I think it was in a book called The Talent Code, but yeah. Oh, yeah? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a psychological principle that, you know, and you know the 10,000 hour rule. So, I mean, deliberate practice is yes. sports. Yes. Yeah, so, so, deliberate practice is this idea that, yeah, you could do 10,000 hours at anything and become an expert at it, but the way to do it faster is to uh, deliberate, to do deliberate practice, which yeah. means you're practicing with the intention of improving mm -hmm. and there's a feedback loop. Yeah. So, so you do just 2000 hours as opposed to 10,000. Correct. Right. Like for example, if you want to become an expert at guitar, <clears throat> learn scales. Don't right. just sit there for 10,000 hours and play the same song. Right. If you learn scales, you get the finger dexterity and the muscle memory yeah, and the neural pathway hard, development. By the way. Yes, so I saw hard. your guitar over there. So hard. <laughs> I saw your guitar. You know, I always wanted to play guitar, but instead I forced my three children to learn. That's good. There you go. <laughs> you just enjoy it. You just <laughs> yeah, watch them. Exactly. My brother's, uh, you know, the number one jazz violinist in the world. What? Yeah. And so I grew up watching the most incredible, like... Now, is he built like you, too? He used to be even, like, more jacked. They used to call him the Incredible Hulk of violin because he was just, like, Wow, snap the jacked. thing in half. Is yeah, he, he, he would. He it. would, like, slam it like Jimi Hendrix style, yeah. Uh, but now he's leaned up a bunch actually. And so he's, yeah, he's incredible. So I used to just be all awestruck by his gifts and it was unbelievable, his skill. And so I learned guitar. I taught myself when I was 18, just cause I was like, I have to know something, you know, in terms That's of music, cool. I can barely, you know, I'm like a hack, but yeah. you know, at least I could do something. Yeah. So, yeah. So I'm, I'm kind of in this mode of. <laughs> of improving myself. And I'll give you one more thing that I'm working yeah. on. So yeah. I kind of think about my life and th my work in three buckets. So we got this bucket here, yep. we got this bucket and we got this bucket. And so when you think about your business or you think about your passion or you think about work, I think about, okay, 
what do I need to do in terms of how much time and what actions do I need to take in order to develop the skills so that I can perform the work? Mm -hmm. So there's the deliberate practice that goes into practicing your skill Skill and your mastery. Yep. Yep. And your competency. Yep. Mastery, so that when it comes time to actually deliver the work, whether that's selling or standing on a stage or writing a book or talking to people or selling real estate or whatever it is that that it may that may be mm-hmm. your passion, deliver. This is the one I neglected last year. Which this is? bucket is what are you doing to personally develop yourself, so that you are the most capable, fulfilled and satisfied human being so that when you show up to do your competency and your Mm -hmm. skills and the delivery that you as the human being are able to do that. Yeah. And so I've been spending a lot more time consuming content, reading books, watching, you know, your incredible show and learning from other people. And I think that one of the traps that we entrepreneurs get into is we, I, I, I was feeling last year anyway, like I was on a treadmill and when I wasn't looking, somebody was coming by and turning up wow, the speed sure. and I was only in this alley. And increasing the, uh, the, the hills. The, <laughs> the bike, whatever yes. The... Yes. And so, and if you're my age, you need like a diaper when somebody <laughs> does that and you're on a treadmill and a leash to the keep incline, you attached yes. to it. Exactly. So, um, I, uh, I've been focusing a lot on this and mm. it's been interesting because you and I were talking earlier too about you going to India and some of the mm. stuff that you learned in terms of the different yeah. states to be in. And I use one where I pay attention to where I'm feeling depleted versus where I'm energized. And mm. here's the thing. You can be doing things that are really hard that energize you. You can be doing things that are really scary that energize you. The same is true with things that deplete you. There are things in your life that are really easy for you. There are people that you hang out with, by the way, that you've been hanging out with for years, Mm -hmm. but they deplete you. And so I've been starting to become more deliberate about how I distance myself from things that deplete me and how I spend more time and energy either doing or pushing myself to do those things that actually energize me. And this gets back to your message around passion, right? right? And that, you know, the the art and the skill of building a life that is guided by the things that you're passionate about. Yeah, that's great. Do you know what the number one habit is that has the greatest impact on the quality of your life when it comes to happiness, success, wellness? The number one habit in personal development. I see meditation in the chat. Do you have a guess? Sleep, I see. Keep going, keep going. Uh, Your thoughts, Uh, Kristen's getting closer. The number, journaling, there's another one. Belief, mindset, feelings, self-talk. The number one habit isn't gratitude, everyone. The number one habit that makes the biggest difference on the quality of your life is being kind to yourself. being kind to yourself. And it is also the habit that we practice the least. And so I'll take it back to everything I've talked about. Sleep and prioritizing it is a way to be kind to yourself. If you love somebody, you want them to get a good night's sleep. It's why we make our kids go to bed so that they can have a good night's sleep and wake up and be in a good mood. And by the way, the mood that you're in in the morning impacts your productivity for the first four hours of the day, positive or negative. When you set the alarm intentionally so that you are thinking about your needs and what waking up for yourself would look like the next morning, you're being kind to yourself. When you wake up for yourself You get out of bed when that alarm rings. You put your hands on your heart and you say, I'm okay, I'm safe, I'm loved. Today's gonna be a good day. You're being kind to yourself. You're being kind to your nervous system. When you make your bed for yourself as a gift to come back to tonight, beautiful place to lay down and sleep and dream and complete the day, you're being kind to yourself. When you give yourself a high five in the mirror, you don't just dismiss yourself or go, oh God, look at these saddlebag jowls. Oh my God, this neck and little food and the gray hair and oh. When you do this instead, you're practicing kindness. When you write down five things that you want, 
you would, you would want your friend to have the things that they want. You cheer for them. But when it comes to you, you don't do that for you. So these are all teeny little habits and behavior changes that allow you to practice not only putting yourself first and building a foundation upon which you can be successful and focused and productive based on the science, but it's so much deeper than that. It's really living your life in a way where you are giving to yourself the thing that you give so freely to everybody else and that you need the most. You're seeing yourself, you're hearing your needs, you're fulfilling your needs, and you're showing yourself the kindness that you deserve. And when you feel uplifted by you, there ain't nothing that's gonna stop you. Being kind to yourself, in my opinion, is also accepting life as it is and not making yourself wrong for the things that you need to do on a day-to-day -day basis to mm -hmm. deal with your life as it is. See, we all have expectations. And I think uh, there's a lot, I, I, I think that there are times where personal development can equal an attempt to be perfect. And that's not what I believe at all. Mm -hmm. I think we're all works in progress. I think unless you wanna be a monk and live on your own, there's no way that you're gonna be able to be in control every single day of your life. And that the skill truly everyone is to ride the up and down waves of life and not have those waves that come crashing over, take you down and leave you in a down. Uh -huh. And, you know, we want to be more like the raft that's riding the waves. And what takes you down even further when your mom who has dementia gets up and it really just, you know, blows a hole in the way that your day is supposed to start is you mentally then start to beat yourself up for the fact that it didn't go how you wanted it to go. Uh -huh. And the real skill in life because there's always gonna be ups and downs, everybody, always. And you don't want it any other way because confidence, uh, resilience, courage, it's like steel, it's forged in fire. Even in those low moments, you've got the biggest opportunity to build your confidence, to build your resilience. Resilience is the ability to not let your emotions hijack you when life happens. It's the ability to ride the waves and you have a particular reality that I don't have right now. You have a mother with dementia mm -hmm. and accepting that that is going to derail certain things and learning how to be kind with yourself and make and allow yourself to ride that wave without making it mean I suck. I blew it. Today sucks. We're off the rails. I might as well not wash my hair. I might as well not make the phone call. Now that this one thing happened, the whole thing is screwed. The real thing is, okay, we're off track for a half an hour and I only have five minutes now. What's the one thing I could do to ground myself? And I'm going to tell you what the one thing is. Put your hands on your heart. You've just right. dealt with this issue with your mom. It's upsetting because she's got dementia, which is upsetting, I'm sure. You put your hands on your heart. You go, I'm okay. I'm safe. I'm loved. Today is still going to be a good day. Uh -huh. And then high five yourself in the mirror and get back out there and skip the part where you make yourself wrong. Okay. What is your limiting belief? What is the thing that you think about yourself? Maybe your parents or your mother or your father taught you to think that way about yourself. Maybe you went through a horrible breakup and that person made you feel unworthy. Maybe you've had a bunch of uh, setbacks in your life and that's what gave you that limiting belief. But what is your limiting belief? Because today, what we're going to do today is we're gonna take it a step further. Now that you've identified your limiting belief, we're going to look at what is it costing you to choose to repeat it. Because remember the quote I started with, you, can, you have a choice right now. You get to repeat the things you've always done or you can evolve them and become more deliberate. Let's talk about the cost of that limiting belief. I'm gonna go first. So write down your limiting belief. I see a lot of, I'm not good enough. My mental health is holding me back. I can't run a successful business. I'm lazy and I can't do anything. I'm not healthy enough. 
Money is the issue. I'm scared to fail. What is the limiting belief that you have? I, I'm certain it has something to do with not being enough. Once you've written that down, you're afraid of failure. You're not, you don't deserve success. All that kind of stuff. I don't know how to start. These are excellent. You're doing an excellent job. The first step to moving from that default into getting deliberate is actually seeing it. So seeing it is fantastic because now we can start to understand that, whoa, this got programmed in. It's my default mode. I want to get rid of it. How do we get rid of it? Well, let's first identify why you want to. Let's take a hard look at the cost, the cost of having this limiting belief. So in order to figure out the cost of having the limiting belief, what's my limiting belief? That I'm not a good person. That's my limiting belief, that I am not a good person, that you don't think I'm a good person, that I don't think I'm a good person. Um, and here's what you're going to do in order to identify the cost, okay? You're gonna ask yourself three questions, and they're very simple. What is this limiting belief in my case that I'm not a good person? What does it cost me in my past to think this way? What is it costing me in this present moment to think that I'm not a good person? And here's the kicker. If I don't evolve this, if I don't get deliberate, what is it going to cost me in the future to continue to think that I'm not a good person? So in the past, thinking that I'm not a good person it did a bunch of things. First of all, it made me very sad. Secondly, it made me a liar because I assumed that I wasn't good enough and I'm not a good person, so I got to pretend to be somebody else. It also made me cheat on people because I didn't think I deserved love. And it also, by believing that I wasn't a good person, it somehow justified the bad behavior. I mean, if I'm a bad person, then I do bad things, right? What does it cost me in the present to believe that I'm not a good person. Well, it costs me a lot of joy. It costs me connection and friendships because I'm constantly questioning whether or not people actually like me for me. Um, it makes me second guess myself and whether or not I deserve the success. And what does it cost me in the future? It's gonna cost me everything. If I continue to repeat this pattern, and I continue to allow myself to default to believing that I'm not a good person, I will never be fully happy. I will never be fully present. I probably will not be successful when we launch this new daytime talk show in the fall. Um, and so I got a choice to make and I want to get rid of this because I can see what allowing myself to believe that I'm not a good person is costing me. This exercise of, of identifying your limiting belief and then seeing what it's cost you in your past, your present, and your future is so important for you to do that I want to give you another example. So to really, really drive it home, okay? And so I want to bring in my husband. Why don't you scoot on this? I don't know if you can lean in on that thing. You sit, sit on this chair. I'm going to bring in my husband, Christopher Robbins. Yes, if you've ever been a fan of Winnie the Pooh, his name is Christopher Robbins. And Chris is going to go through this exercise too. And um, I think it's important for we're, 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 we're sharing a chair here. And so we're like really close. Um, I think it's important for you guys to know that uh, Chris uh, is one of the partners in our media company. He's our CFO and he's also the founder of a men's retreat called Soul Degree. And he's a yoga instructor and president of the Booster Club. So this is a guy that's like really accomplished um, and super amazing. So uh, with that context, founder of Soul Degree, what's your limiting belief? Well, of course, it would be appropriate <laughs> that I think forever it's just been that I'm not good enough, that I'm, I think that's it, succinctly, that I'm not living up. And certainly in the past, it's been all around the decisions I've made career-wise um, never thinking that I was in fact good enough, which just took away from, I suppose, all the joy that I could have had. Were you really sad when you were little? Yeah. I think I was just down and out, probably feeling alone and like the decisions I had made along the path were not the right ones. And then that subsequently not performing and, um, or at least not performing to my, my own expectation. Um, 
So how has not feeling good enough? I can see how it would make you feel sad, especially, you know, there's so much pressure on men to succeed, feeling like you weren't good enough in your career, blah, blah, blah. Even ski racing, because you grew up as a kid ski racing. How did be feeling not good enough impact the way you raced? I probably just could have skied a lot better than even I did because I was constantly thinking it wasn't good enough. And now what about in the present? What is the default belief that you're not good? Is it like, how is it still in your life in this moment? Because here's the thing about a limiting belief, guys, is that everybody will look at you on the outside and they'll be convinced you don't have it. They'll be shocked that you, you believe that about yourself. And that's why it's important for you to be honest with yourself about what your limiting belief is, because it's something you are doing to yourself. So what is it that, what is the belief that you're not good enough? How is that impacting your life right now, Chris? Uh, probably has everything to do with just being the point parent as much as I love being the point parent and having the time with the kids that I have given your own schedule. Let me explain what that means. So I, Chris and I have a, um, have Chris and I, because of the amount of work that I use, Chris is the one that is home more often. He's the one that is really in charge of what's going on with the kids. He, um, has been home for these last three to four years, playing a huge role in the back end of our company. But the primary role is the parent. And traditionally, at least in the United States, it's the woman that does that. And so it's been, I think, a very fulfilling yet confronting uh, thing for Chris to be playing that role in, am I saying this correctly? Totally. Just to bring everybody yeah. up to speed? Just embracing the idea that me being the one at home handling the lion's share of the things at home are of course consistent with my <laughs> negative belief that that's not good enough that that's not being supportive enough uh, is it also with success like that's not enough yeah, in terms of your not, own career even though you yeah, found it a men's from, retreat well <laughs> <laughs> seriously you mean well you run soul degree you run the booster club for the high school you teach yoga classes you are a CFO and it's still not enough. And here's the thing that's so interesting, everybody. Hmm. I'm going to ask Chris a question he doesn't know I'm going to ask him. If you could go back and do something different these last three or four years and actually go and work and build your own, build a business that's solely your own and not be around. And I mean, would you trade the years that you've had with our kids the last three years or for something else. No, definitely not. <laughs> well, see, then that's the thing that's crazy is here you're sitting here torturing yourself saying you're not good enough. You're not good enough. It's not enough. It's not enough. But given the option, if we could wave a magic wand and change everything and the circumstances would be different, but you had to trade the time that you had with our kids, would you do it? The answer is no. So here's the thing that's interesting, and I'm so happy that you admitted to that because it points out the fact that your default thinking isn't logical. It's just a habit. It's something you've been doing for so long that you don't even realize it. And even though it doesn't serve you, and even though, like Chris just said, he would never change a thing. And yet he still thinks it's not enough. That to me means that there is some automation here that's going on in your brain where it's set on default. Oh, I got to just think I'm not enough. I got to think I'm not enough. I got to think I'm not enough. You know, well, here's the bigger question. If you allow this default mode to stay programmed in your brain, how is that going to impact your future? Particularly if you think about things like your aspirations for soul degree, the, you know, the men's retreat that you run. Hmm. It's, yeah, I think that if, if it perpetuates, then I'm, I'm obviously my own impediment to what I want it to be. You know, I, if I'm, if I'm constantly in that mindset of it's not enough, I haven't done enough, 
then how could Soul Degree ever become what it should be? What do you want it to become? Uh, I think it, I would love to see it touch as many men's lives. You're about to cry, I could tell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as possible. Um, Why do you get choked up? Uh, just because I know the impact. I've experienced the positive impact that it can have. And I don't, it's, it's, it's limitless, I think, in the difference that it could make, regardless even of your age. So it's. Do you see how your limiting belief, hmm. the default thinking that you're not enough, will prevent you from? Oh, totally. How does it stop you when you think you're not enough? How does it stop you? Like, what are the things that, that you do when you start getting in that, that mindset? Well, it's probably things that you don't do, right? Because you're not, if you're not going to be good enough, well, why go do that thing? Whether it's write more or, um, you know, sort of test the elasticity of what soul degree could be also. I mean, it's in, its, it's in a state uh, where there's still so much that we could do to enhance the experience have it reach more people, which starts with my own. Again, I think part of the limitation is that I've always argued, hey, I'm a shitty marketer. I don't, I'm not good at um, putting the word out, if you will. And even this conversation, <laughs> talking about something like Soul Degree is... How many of you can relate to this? It's I, I could be a lot better. You're just stopping yourself, <laughs> not all the time, because of your limiting belief. Like you go to write a blog post about the thing that fills your heart, and you're like, "Ooh, should I really put this out there?" Uh, that's your limiting belief. That's your default setting, and you're dead right, Chris. That and it's the same thing for me, and the same thing for Mandy. What was yours? I'll I'll never get there. I'll never get there. I love that one. I'll never get there. Yeah. Because you can feel like just the, the no matter how hard I try, it's never going to be enough. I'm never going to get there. It's never going to happen. And how that, that sets you up to just race and race and race and race. And Danielle, what's yours? I'm not smart enough. I'm not smart enough. Yeah, I'm not smart enough to do this. And so if your belief, the default that got programmed a long time ago is I'm not smart enough, then you'll tell yourself, I'm not smart enough to write this blog post. I'm not smart enough to figure this out. I'm not smart enough to build that kind of business. I'm not smart enough to attract the kind of person that I want. And the thing that's scary about default settings, everybody, is that not only are they automated in the default network in your brain, but they're a protection mechanism. By thinking you're not good enough, not smart enough, I'll never get there, I'm a, not a good person, you actually hold yourself back. And that's one of the reasons why we cling to it. And so if you haven't already, because we're going to wrap up this training and I'm going to tell you what's coming up tomorrow and then we're going to answer questions. Um, if you haven't already, you gotta please. You got to hear the quote, though, from Nepo today. Oh, okay. It's so on point. See, soul topic. degree right here. So every it's so morning. It's so cheesy, but no, it's, it's so not. good. Every morning, Chris and I mostly sometimes. Um, <laughs> Uh, Chris reads from this. This is so tattered. He's been doing it for years. My mom also reads this book every single day. Your mom reads this book every single day. It's a page or two every single day. Mark Nero was, uh, was fighting cancer when he wrote this and it's beautiful. So Nepo, the, Nepo. Mark Nepo. Did I say it wrong? <laughs> Nemo. <laughs> I said Nemo. <laughs> but finding I'll just, Nemo. I'll just read a snippet because it's so on point for January 3rd. That is okay. the third, right? Today? Yeah. Yeah. Each person is born with an unencumbered spot, free of expectation and regret, free of ambition and embarrassment, free of fear and worry, an umbilical spot of grace where we are each first touched by God. It is this spot of grace that issues peace. Psychologists call this spot the psyche. Theologians call it the soul. Jung calls it the seat of the un unconscious. Hindu masters call it the Atman. Buddhists call it Dharma. Rilke calls it inwardness, Sufis call it qualb, 
and Jesus calls it the center of our love. To know the spot of inwardness is to know who we are, not by surface markers of identity, not by where we work or what we wear or how we like to be addressed, but by feeling our place in relation to the infinite and by inhabiting it. This is the hard lifelong task for the nature of becoming is a constant filming over where we begin while the nature of being is a constant erosion of what is not essential. Oh. Each of us lives in the midst of this ongoing tension, growing tarnished or covered over, only to be worn back to that incorruptible spot of grace at our core. Well, I would say the one word that came to mind when you were reading that was, let's see if I can find it, not essential. Mm. You know, what's not essential is your default thinking and your negative belief, and in fact, it is essential that you get rid of it. You're awesome. You don't have to go. I'm gonna, but I'm gonna keep wrapping this. I am this. gonna go. You are going. Where are you Bye going? <laughs> I'm sure you he's have. got a blog post to write because now he's exactly. gotten rid of his his uh, limiting belief. <laughs> Bye. Mm -hmm. See ya. Okay. Um, so tomorrow, so I want you to write your limiting belief in there, and and here's another thing. What is it costing you right now? What are the things you're not doing because of that? limiting belief. For me, not being a good person, I think it's the thing that keeps me isolating myself. And it also, I can see how just like Chris was explaining that his limiting belief has him not doing things like writing more blog posts and putting himself out there. I, even though I'm out there, there's, I think a level to which I'm not because of this belief that I'm not a good person. Um, so I want you to write in the comments, what's your limiting belief and what's it costing you right now? What are you not doing because of it? And I want to come back to the opening quote. You have a choice. You're either going to repeat what you're doing or you're going to evolve it. And when you ask yourself these three questions, what is my limiting belief cost me in the past? What's it costing me right now? And what is it going to cost me if I continue to choose to do it? If I continue to choose to be on default, hopefully getting in touch with that will help you, give you, motivate you, push you to choose to be deliberate in what you're thinking next. Because tomorrow, tomorrow what we're going to be talking about is how do you create a deliberate belief, one that you don't believe yet. We're going to teach you how to think this, not that. Because it's essential that you have something to go to for when you catch yourself going to that default. So trust me when I tell you tomorrow we are going to take you from the, oh my God, I'm, I'm, I, need to, I need to stop doing this, and into the mode of, okay, I got this. I can think this, not that. Today what we're going to be talking about is we're going to be talking about the powerful connection between your mindset and your morning routine. And I'm going to give you an assignment at the end of this training. Tomorrow, we're going to build on this. So this entire week, what we're going to be talking about are the components to your morning because your mindset and having a powerful mindset and being deliberate about what you're going to think about and what you're not going to think about, it begins the moment you wake up. And believe it or not, how you wake up, not when, but how you wake up and the first few things that you do in the morning will dictate your mood for the rest of the day, which based on science is going to impact your productivity and it's going to impact how you feel about your life. And it will also impact your mindset for the rest of the day. And that's why now that we've done in days one, two, three, four, and five, we've done foundational training. You've learned a tremendous amount about how your brain works, about your default network, about how to be a deliberate thinker. You've spotted your limiting beliefs. You've learned how to think this, not that. You've started the skill and the practice of the skill. Remember, it's a process, not an event, to be a positive thinker. Um, you've started practicing, catching your limiting beliefs, and swapping from that default way of viewing the world and thinking about yourself and choosing deliberate thoughts. Now let's talk about physical habits that you can adopt that are very simple, that will be life changing because they will impact your ability to be in control of what you're thinking and to be deliberate. And that begins with how you wake up. 
So let me talk about the morning. You can think about your morning routine and whether or not you even have one in the exact same way that we think about the brain. You're either defaulting to something that you've always done that may not, no longer serve you, or you're getting deliberate and choosing to do something that's more positive and powerful because you deserve it. And that starts with your morning routine. So if you're the kind of person where the alarm goes off and you hit the snooze and then the alarm goes off again and you hit the snooze and, you know, eventually you roll out of bed and you step into your day and you maybe drink a big dark cup of coffee and you skip breakfast and you skip exercise and you're tired. If that's how you start your day, your mindset is going to be impacted by that. If your alarm goes off and you immediately reach for your phone and you start scrolling through Instagram while you're in bed and looking at Facebook and you are putting all kinds of stuff in your brain that triggers FOMO, that triggers insecurity, that triggers anxiety, that is going to impact your mindset for the rest of the day. And so starting tonight, I want you to take control and be more deliberate about your habits in the morning. And what we're going to do this week is we are going to build, based on science, the most powerful morning routine that you could possibly have. Sorry, I'm just moving this around so that the Instagram channel is brighter. The most powerful morning routine that you could possibly have based on science. It's super simple. It will help you become a more deliberate and positive thinker. And I'm going to walk you through step by step. And you're going to be doing this with more than 230,000 people around the world. So what is the assignment tonight? The assignment tonight is very simple and you're going to hate it. You're totally able to do this and most of you are not going to. You're going to let your limiting beliefs and your default mode of thinking stop you from making this simple change. And the thing that I want you to do tonight, this is your assignment. This smartphone right here, I don't want it anywhere near your bedroom. Your assignment is when you go to bed tonight, you are to plug your smartphone in outside of your bedroom. If you live in a studio apartment, put it on the other side of the room. I don't want this phone anywhere near where you sleep. And there's a simple reason why you're addicted to it. And if it's next to you while you're sleeping, as soon as you wake up, without even thinking, the default mode of your brain will mindlessly reach for this and you will lie in bed and you will look at your phone. And when you do that, you are putting in garbage into your brain before you even get out of bed. If you wake up anxious, if you wake up overwhelmed, if you wake up feeling like you're losing some imaginary race, if you wake up and you feel dread, if you wake up and feel negative or exhausted, I'm telling you, this is the reason why. And if you want to have a positive mindset this year, and you deserve to, then you also have to get very deliberate about your habits and about your morning routine in particular. Because how you wake up matters. How you wake up determines your mood. How you wake up determines on your phone. Hold on. IG is pausing a lot. Hold on a second. Let's see here. Um, yikes. All right. Hold on a second. IG, uh, I'm getting a lot of, uh, let's get on Wi-Fi. Rendezvous. Let's see if that works. Looks like I'm on. Let's go back to Instagram. Okay, let's see if that works. Is that better, Mandy? Um, thank you for your patience, by the way. Normally, our streams are not as spotty, but when we started this program, I knew that I was going to be traveling 24 out of the 35 days that we we're broadcasting live, and tech can be a challenge. And so for those of you that have been hanging in there on Instagram, if it's spotty, jump over to Facebook Live, jump over to YouTube, jump over to Twitter. We're streaming on all four platforms at once. Um, and we will also email you a link to this video, which is one of the reasons why, if you haven't yet, sign up for melrobbins.com slash mindset reset, because we curate all this information for you and we tee it up for you every day. 
Um, so thank you for your patience as I am broadcasting from uh, my parents' place. My mother's 70th birthday is tomorrow. And um, for those of you that are just tuning in because the stream has been dicey, we're talking about the powerful connection between your mindset and your morning routine. In fact, I would say it's not even powerful, it's critical. You cannot have a positive in control mindset if you don't have control of your mornings. And it makes a lot of sense from a common sense standpoint, right? If you wake up and you're behind the ball and if you wake up and you've got your phone in your face and you're not even out of bed yet and you're looking at uh, everybody's perfect life on Facebook and on Instagram and on Twitter or you're reading the news and getting stressed out, you're absolutely positively not going to start your day off right. So the assignment that I have for you is a very simple one, and it's one that you're going to be tempted to ignore. Do not ignore this. Tonight, when you go to bed, you are to put your phone as far away from your bed as you possibly can. If you have a bedroom, get your phone charging outside of your bedroom. Turn the vibration off, and you can turn the ringer on. Um, and here's why. I know many of you are single parents. I know um, many of you have jobs where people need to get a hold of you. Uh, Instagram is reconnecting again, so I don't know what to make of this. Um, I apologize for the feed on Instagram, everybody. Uh, but if you, if you start your day by looking at this, your mind is hijacked and you're going to be playing catch up all day long. I want to give your brain a fighting chance to be deliberate. Tonight, what I want you to do is sleep without your phone. Plug your phone in outside of your room, and then when you get up, you're going to notice something. You're going to notice that you automatically reach for your phone. Your phone's not going to be there. You see, we're setting a trap. We're setting a trap so that you don't fall into the default mode of laying in bed and looking at that thing. I want to give you a chance to catch your thoughts. I want to give you a chance to do a couple things in the morning based on science that will give you control over your day, that will boost your mood, and that will help you develop a much more deliberate and positive mindset. So you got it? If you're going to do this, I want you to put the, the uh, bicep pump curl you know, emoji or give me a thumbs up in the comments below if you're going to try this. Because it's a lot harder than you think. And even those of you that are like, oh, I don't look at my phone, baloney. Every one of us is addicted to this thing. I'd like to take some questions real quick about mindset, about the mindset um, morning routine connection, about the cell phone, or about anything related to mindset reset. Uh, Danielle from Facebook, I love routines as well, but what if you let go of your routine? Can you still embrace yourself and the day? I'm not sure I understand the question. I love routines as well. I think that, yes, you can, rec if what you're basically saying is you have a morning where you don't do your normal routine and now it's noon and you realize, my gosh, I've spent the day, the morning in a negative mindset. Can you catch yourself? Absolutely. You absolutely at any moment during the day can catch negative beliefs. You can catch limiting beliefs. You can catch yourself when you default to the negative things that you've trained yourself to think. And you can five, four, three, two, one in five seconds flat. You can switch to a more positive belief. Absolutely. You can change your attitude like that. No question. You can put the force fields up if you feel yourself getting sucked into somebody else's drama. What I'm trying to tell you is that while that's possible, and while you should do that all day, particularly as you are practicing the skill of having a positive mind, I am here to tell you, based on personal experience, that when you start to own your morning, and when you start to take your morning routine seriously as a habit that you develop that contributes to your mindset and your happiness and your sense of control, it will change your life. If you're concerned about anxiety, having a morning routine that I'm going to walk you through step by step this entire week, this is key to curing yourself of anxiety. And it begins the night before. So Betsy asked, is it better to prep the night before? Absolutely. So the night before, 
I um, always plug my phone into the kitchen or I plug it into my closet. I turn off the alerts on my text messages. I turn off the buzzing and I leave the ringer on in case there's some kind of emergency. My kids know that they should call me if they need to reach me. We have a daughter who's in college and, you know, kids are all over the place these days. My business partner knows, call me if you need to reach me. Do not text me. And that one habit has changed my mindset for the better. It's changed my life for the better because when I wake up in the morning, I actually get out of bed. I don't scroll through my phone. And because my phone is nowhere near me, I don't even reach for it. I spend the first 30 minutes to an hour of my day before I even look at my phone. And it has been a game changer, both in my ability to cure my anxiety and in my ability to be deliberate about what I want A, to be thinking about, and B, what I want to be focused on for this day. Um, uh, Tatiana on Instagram, I switch my phone to airplane mode or turn it off completely for the night. Is this okay or the equivalent? It's, it's definitely okay, but I don't want it near your bed because I don't even want you tempted to reach for this thing and to start scrolling through it. You, we, we live in a moment of time, here comes my father, where we need to have major boundaries with our phone. This right here, it's supposed to be a tool, but we have become the tool. Advertisers know that they can make money on your attention. So when you look at this, whether you're looking at your email or you're looking at Facebook or you're looking at social media, you are giving the world your most precious commodity, which is your attention. And so you're going to hear me hammer the fact that boundaries with this, essential for your mindset, essential for your happiness, essential for your success. Um, Vicki from Twitter, why is morning routine so important? What two to three items should be a part of it? Why is the morning routine so important? A couple things. How you wake up has a scientifically proven impact on your ability to focus, on your happiness, and on your productivity all day. This is not something I've made up. This is well-established research. And I'm going to be explaining it to you in bite-sized pieces all week long. And so to preview it, we're going to be talking about this tomorrow morning. The two to three pieces of it are, for me, I wake up when the alarm goes off. And I'm going to explain the science why the snooze alarm is uh, horrendous for your productivity. It actually impacts the way that your brain functions when you do it. We'll explain that in a training this week. I then get up, and for the first couple minutes of the day, I plan my day. And I have a particular process that I go through that leverages something from Harvard Business School called the Progress Principle. Uh, I have a mindfulness practice. That could be anything that you want. It could be gratitude journaling. It could be meditation. It could be five slow, deep breaths. It could be taking your, your dog outside for a walk. And then on mornings when I can, I have a micro exercise practice where I do planks for five minutes or I do something to get my blood pumping on the mornings that I can. I, and I do all that before I ever even look at my phone because I put myself and my mindset first deliberately before I ever allow the world access to my mind. You do not want anybody to have access to what's going on up here until you've gotten deliberate about what you're thinking about first. Um, so that's a preview, but I'm going to, as I promised, this was going to be bite-sized stuff. If you've, if you've already watched the first 10 minutes of this, you got the training for today, which is the powerful connection between your mindset and your morning routine. And your morning routine begins the night before when you plug your phone outside of your bedroom and you go to bed without your phone anywhere near you. Um, the other reason why that's important is we know based on research that the blue light on these things impacts your ability to fall into a deep sleep. Sleep is essential for you to have a healthy mindset. And also when you wake up, if this is next to you, 87% of adults sleep with their phones or next to their phones. And 33% of adults check email in the middle of the night. And so whether you're willing to admit that or not, we want to break your habit 
of giving the world access to your mind. And we want to make you more deliberate about how you are with your phone. And the reason why is it has a direct scientific researched impact on your mood and your mindset all day. Um, I have time for just one or two more questions. Uh, if you have any other questions about this, seeing a ton of, but my phone is my alarm. I have kids. Do you see the excuses, everybody? What's more important? If you have kids, do exactly what I told you. Leave the ringer on. If your kids need you, they can call you. If your boss needs you, they can call you. And this is really important for your kids too. You know, there's a lot of research about kids and phones and how they're hugely addicted. And the thing about kids and phones, particularly phones in their bedroom when they're going to sleep at night, is that if you have teenagers, teenagers are biologically hardwired to push away from their parents when they become teenagers. Their friends become their primary uh, support group. They become the most important thing in their life. And kids feel a obligation to stay connected to their friends. And they feel an obligation that if I'm not available for my friends, you know, that makes me not a good friend. And so to help your kids, you need to draw the boundaries for them. You need to tell them that they can't have their phone in the um, bedroom. You need to have a charging station in the kitchen and you need to model these very healthy and mandatory boundaries with technology, period. And so I get it. Your kids need to reach you. No problem. Plug it into the closet. Plug it into the bathroom. Turn the ringer on. If there's an emergency, they can call you. Yes, you can use your phone as your alarm. Plug it into the bathroom. Plug it into the closet. Plug it into the kitchen. Because if the alarm is going off outside of your bedroom or several paces away from your bed, guess what you're doing when the alarm goes off? You're getting up. And tomorrow... I'm going to explain the science behind why you need to get up when the alarm rings and why you should not hit the snooze alarm. I don't hit the snooze alarm because I understand the neurological impact that the act of snoozing has on your mindset, on your mood, and on your brain's ability to focus. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about tomorrow. The reason why you have to get up when the alarm rings, and it's not because it sounds like a good idea, it's because of the science behind how your brain works and what hitting the snooze button and drifting back to sleep for 15 minutes does to your mind. You're going to learn all about that tomorrow, and it is a game changer. So, Mandy and Danielle, do we have any other comments, questions, excuses? Give me the thumbs up if you're going to try this phone challenge. This is going to change your life. Try the phone challenge tonight. Give it one night. And I want you to notice as you do it, how drawn are you to your phone? How panicky are you that it's not near you? Do you feel anxious about it? When you wake up in the morning, are you immediately grabbing for it? I want you to notice the default mode that you have with this sucker right here. Because part of being deliberate and serious about being a healthy, happy, anxiety-free positive, confident thinker is taking control and having boundaries between the world and your mind. And it's also having the assuredness that you can live without this thing. I haven't lost anybody that I love. So I would not say what I'm about to say if somebody that I loved had died in this pandemic. But I have found the great pause that the last two months have forced me to take to be the greatest gift that I have received in the last decade. My kids have been home. I have been off the road. I have been forced to slow down. I have been reminded of what actually matters, your health, your family, your friends, what you're doing to take care of your mind and your body and your spirit and making sure that you do something 
with the time that you have that you really, really enjoy. And the other thing that it's really made me stop and think about is making sure that I'm having fun, that my whole life isn't just work. And it's made me really start to think about the fact that I don't wanna go back to the life that I was living before the pandemic hit. How many of you feel that way? That this has been a gigantic mental perspective switch reset button that has boom, hit you really hard. I wanna know in the comments, what is it that you with this new perspective that the pandemic has given you, what is it that you wanna change in your life coming out of this? I wanna start seeing, I see people saying this has been a wake up call. I see people saying, yes, this has been a huge shift in my perspective. I see Brianna saying, I wanna travel less for work. What do you want? Kelly says she's had a mental switch. Kelly, what has this pandemic given you in terms of the gift? Heather's saying, I wanna ask myself, what do I really wanna do? Kim says, I don't wanna go back to the rat race. Brock says, I want to start the year uh, excited about it. Uh, I see somebody saying, uh, Larissa says, a new business. Uh, Megan says, I want more boundaries. Tara says, I want to have more fun. What is it that you want to change given the gift that this pandemic has given you in terms of shifting your perspective? Dinky says, value my friends and family. Uh, jealous is take care of my mental health. Spend more time with family. What do you want to change, everybody? Seriously, what do you want to change about your life? Is it a relationship? Is it that you have had the time to take care of yourself in small ways and that's giving you greater control in your life? Do you want to change your job coming out of this? Do you want to launch a business coming out of this? Do you want to um, change uh, your timeline for achieving your goals? Is there some project that you want to take on? Because what you're going to hear me say over and over again is that the single most, impro most important project you could ever work on is yourself. And the greatest gift that any challenge will ever give you is a perspective shift and the realization that you can face hard things, that you can survive hard things, and that in learning more deeply about yourself and about what you value through the challenges in life, you are going to be handed a moment where you can make a decision you hear me say all the time, you're one decision away from a different life. Changing your life does not take motivation. Motivation is garbage. Changing your life takes discipline. The discipline to make a decision to change. You see, you need three things if you want to come out of this pandemic and truly change your life for the better. So many of you do not want to go back to the life that you were living. You see something greater for you. And what you're going to need in order to make that shift is you need clarity. You need the clarity to write the change down. And I want you to start right now. What in the comments? Let's get really clear. Terry wants to come out of this a healthier and better person. What is the clarity? Tell me the change that you want to make coming out of this. You got to have the clarity to write it down. That's number one. The second thing that you got to have in order to make a change happen is you've got to learn the skill of confidence, which is the ability to try something when you don't feel ready. You may not know how to do this change. I see advocate for myself. I see more physical movement. I see I want to change my job. I want to start a business. I want to earn more money. I want to travel less. I want my work to have meaning. I want to get out of an abusive relationship. I want to help people in need. 
I want to make sure that I continue to keep the promises that I've been keeping, getting up on time, working out every day, working on my relationship. This is fantastic because you're having a moment of clarity. And when you start to write it down, you are starting to develop the confidence and the knowing that you deserve to have this change happen. And then finally, what do you need in order to really change your life? Because it's not motivation, everybody. It's discipline. Discipline to make small promises, keep small promises. Discipline to take small actions when you feel afraid. The discipline to find the courage to push yourself forward when you don't know how. That's how you change your life. Just those three things. Clarity, confidence, courage. That's all you need. And that's why you got me in your life, because I'm here to push you. I'm here to encourage you. And I love seeing what you want to change. That, oh, I see you need help building confidence. No problem. I got you covered. Because confidence isn't something that you feel. Confidence is a skill. Confidence is the willingness to try because it's through the act of trying, through the act of simply writing down what's the change that you wanna make right there in the comments. Just writing it down and trying it out, trying out writing what that feels like, that's gonna show you that you have the ability to start to express the things that you want. And that's the first step, to claim these things that you think about. Um, so for those of you, more than a hundred of you who have written to me in the last week and who have said, I've had a huge perspective shift thanks to this pandemic. And there are some major changes I want to make in my life. I want to start a women's group. I want to end this relationship that I'm in. I want to stop bashing myself all the time. I want to launch that business I've been talking about. All of the things that you've put on hold. Now is the time to change. So many of you ask me, is it the right time to change your job after a pandemic like this? Absolutely. Because if you don't hear the clarity that's inside you, if you don't quiet the noise and tune in to hear, if your instincts, if your wisdom, if your knowing, if inside of you, you hear yourself saying, I got to get a new job. I got to get out of this relationship. I don't want to live where I live anymore. I want to be near the water. I want to be in the mountains. I want to be out of the city. I, you have to tune into that stuff. And then it's about confidence and courage to take action. That's it. So extroverts, introverts. A lot of us really, I know I did this. I was all wrong about what confidence meant. I thought confidence was a personality trait. Mm, I love this. Tell me more. I thought that people that are outgoing are the confident ones, mm. right? And the truth is, confidence is not a personality trait at all. It's a skill. And a lot of the extroverted people that you know are actually very insecure. I used to be one of them. I used to be the kind of bossy, crass, loudmouth that didn't believe in myself, that didn't believe in my ideas, that didn't have the confidence and the courage to really be the real me, right. who I am, who I'm not, flaws and all. There are a tremendous number of introverted people that feel uncomfortable uh, putting the attention on themselves, but they're very, very confident in their ideas. They definitely believe in themselves. And so when you start to separate confidence, not as a matter of personality, but as a skill that you can acquire because confidence is the ability to move, in my opinion, from thought to action. Mm. Because when you're a confident person, you believe enough in yourself and your capabilities that you're willing to try, that you're willing to share. To me, confidence isn't the assuredness that it turns out, it's the willingness to try. And, and that was a huge insight for me. And, and what a lot of people don't know about me, although I, I share this on stage and I'm extremely open about this because this is a, a, a topic that's really important to me, is that the m single most profound use of the five second rule is mind control. And I say that as a lawyer, mm. I will tell you, you can use this stupid trick to cure yourself of anxiety. 
Yeah, I wanted to talk about that. So you struggled very profoundly mm -hmm. with anxiety. Mm -hmm. So walk us through like some nuts and bolts of how you use the five second rule. Cause I think we're, so my hypothesis and the reason we founded Impact Theory is that the world is living through two pandemics, the pandemic of the body, which everybody understands because it's so visual, yep. being overweight, dying of um, diet related diseases such as diabetes and things like that. But because the second pandemic, the pandemic of the mind is invisible, um, people don't realize how pervasive um, a suicide is and that it's, yeah. I think it's a leading cause of death among young men. I mean, it's crazy. Uh, and then that there are ways that they can go about attacking that and fixing the problem. So yeah, yeah. walk us through that. Sure, I would love to. Um, so first of all, I literally have struggled with anxiety my entire life. And anxiety for this conversation, the way I define it, is it is the habit of worrying mm. spiraled out of control. You know, you may say that you are a worrier. That's not true. You have a habit of worrying. A habit is a pattern of behavior or thinking that you repeat without realizing it. So anxiety happens when that pattern of worrying about things spirals out of control and now it starts to marry and manifest itself with physical sensations too. Mm -hmm. That's all that it is. I know that I say that's all that it is. <laughs> Me personally, I struggled with anxiety uh, I think my entire life. It became quite acute when I was in my late teens and early 20s. I became medicated in the middle of law school. I took Zoloft for two decades. When our first daughter was born, who is now 17, the postpartum depression and the cascading panic was so terrible that not only was I medicated and couldn't breastfeed, but I couldn't be left alone with her. Wow. So when I say you can cure yourself of anxiety, I don't say that lightly. Mm. Four years ago, after I had been using the five second rule to change my behavior, how I spoke to my husband, how I negotiate in business meetings, how I conduct sales, the kind of parent that I am, my health habits, my eating habits, curbing the drinking. Um, I thought, I wonder if I can use this five, four, three, two, one thing to get control of my thought patterns, not my behavior patterns, my thought patterns. Yes, you can. So we're going we're gonna to build this conversation because I want to start with something we can all uh, relate to, and that is how do you stop worrying and how do you stop listening to self-doubt? This is how you're going to do it. So all day long, you're going to have moments where your thoughts drift, and I use that word on purpose because for me, there is a physical sensation when you start to use the five-second rule and you start to wake up. Mm. Not only on time in the morning, but you wake up to your life and the opportunities in your life. There's your thoughts drift. Like you'll just be hanging out with your friends and then suddenly you're like, I'm not sure that that person likes me anymore. <laughs> you know, I haven't heard from my kids lately. I wonder if they're dead or, you know, oh, you know, it's like check. Like you just start worrying about stuff. Mm. Why? Because it's a habit. Because when you're not paying attention, your brain shifts from you being a decision maker and paying attention to you just kind of spinning things on autopilot and one of your habits is worrying. The second you wake up and you notice, holy cow, I'm talking some negative garbage to myself right now. Mm. Five, four, three, two, one. You've just shifted the part of the brain that you're using. You've shifted from the basal ganglia, which is where your habit loops are spinning and you've awakened your prefrontal cortex. You've also interrupted that pattern. Now what you're going to do, because your mind is actually ready to receive a different thought because of the counting, now you can put in an anchor thought. Like if you have a mantra, if you've got a vision about the way that your business is gonna turn out in five years, if you just have a thought that makes you really happy and proud, insert that. Now, why does this work? It works because of the counting. And I'm not kidding. We know, based on research, that positive thinking alone, not effective. In some instances, trying to force yourself to think positive can actually make the worries worse. Why? Well, the reason why is because it's really hard to just change the channel. What we have to do first is basically interrupt it and turn off the TV and then turn it back on with the prefrontal cortex awakened. So the counting is essential. And so you can start using this today. You catch yourself talking garbage to yourself because we all know if I were to put a speaker on your head and broadcast, <laughs> you'd be sitting here in the audience, you'd be in an insane asylum because the crap that you say to yourself is insane. And the problem is we listen to it. 
you'll be you'll be in a sales meeting and you'll be undermining yourself. They're not going to buy. Oh my gosh, I'm in trouble. You're not even present. Five, four, three, two, one. Switch it back. Get back to that vision that you have about toasting your success or this customer being really happy or you being proud of yourself. Mm. Whatever that vision may be, you can control your thoughts. And this is not just us talking about it. This is a tool that you can use. So let's take it a step further. So worrying, if you let it go unchecked, what will happen is you will get used to worrying. You will get used to living in a state where you're slightly agitated all the time. Let me talk a little bit about agitation. So what we know based on research is that physically, in your body, so physiologically, being excited is the exact same thing as being afraid. Let me say that again, because it is so important. In your body, being excited is the exact same thing as being afraid. Your body doesn't know the damn difference. Your heart oh, races, heart your really armpits right. sweat, you're like, you know, you may get tight in your throat. You may, your cheeks may get pink like my do when I get excited. The only difference between excitement and fear is what your brain says. And the problem is if you have a habit of worrying, guess what you're gonna tell yourself is going on? That you're, that you're like freaking out that you're not excited, that something must be wrong. Oh gosh, why would you say something's wrong? Because you got a habit of saying that all the time. Even as I became a, a speaker for a living or I'd be on CNN, when I first started doing it, I would be freaking out backstage. But even, even though, like, you know, just, a couple, just last week, he's standing backstage, about to go on, 8,000 people, heart races, armpit sweat, mm. you know, my hands get clammy. I'm not nervous though, not at all, I'm excited. And so I developed this technique and research uh, out of Harvard, not based on my technique, but something very similar, proves that if you basically, right before you're about to do something, take a test, run a race, public speaking, a business negotiation, ask somebody to marry you, whatever it may be that gets your heart racing, just do this. Go, I'm excited. I'm excited to give that speech. I'm excited to ask him or her. I'm excited to do this race. I'm excited. Because what happens is you give your brain context so your brain doesn't escalate the stuff going on mm. in your body. Your brain's not worried. Make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can combine this with the five second rule. So we know how to do worrying. You, ca you catch your thoughts drift, five, four, three, two, one, anchor thought. If you start to feel your heart racing, five, four, three, two, one, to awaken the prefrontal cortex and then start going, I'm really excited to do this. I'm really excited to do this. Another technique that you can use is ask, um, I think they call it interrog interrogatory questions, mm. where instead of giving yourself a pep talk, say, well, why am I ready to do this? Why am I ready? Because that'll force you to answer the question, which then convinces you. Mm. So why am I ready to close the sale? Why am I ready to give this speech? Why am I ready? So those are two strategies that you can use back by science that are proven to actually make your performance be much better. Now let's take it a step further to anxiety. So. Anxiety is what happens when the habit of worrying spins out of control, your body gets really agitated, and then you allow your mind to escalate it mm. into a full-blown panic attack. So for those of you that have not had the pleasure of having a panic attack, <laughs> let me um, explain what it's like. So have you ever been in your car and you're driving down the road and you go to change lanes and all of a sudden there's like, oh my God, there's a car right there, yeah. right? And you swerve a little bit and then your heart's like, and you may sweat a little bit and, and you grip the wheel really tight and you're super locked in on, on the road ahead of you. Mm. But then that car pulls away and the, the, the near miss scenario passes and your mind starts going, okay, you're all right now. Right. You're all right now. That's it. That's all. That's what a panic attack is. Only it happens while you're standing in front of your coffee pot. <laughs> Seriously. You have that same, oh my God, way behind that and your heart's racing, and, and the problem for your brain is that your brain can't look around and say, holy cow, we almost got hit by a car. Right. Your brain's saying, what the hell is wrong with her? She's making coffee and she's freaking out. And so now your brain has a problem, because what's your brain's job? It's designed to protect you. Mm. So your brain will now do whatever it can to magnify the problem. Remember we talked about the spotlight effect? 
it'll start telling you all kinds of crazy stuff because it can't figure out contextually what the hell's going on. She's just making coffee, now her heart is racing and she's breathing really. Holy cow, maybe she is having a heart attack. Mm. A lot of people that have panic attacks say, I think I'm dying, oh my God, what's, what's happening? Wow. Or you'll see them do the deer in the headlights thing where they gotta get out of the room. That is the spotlight effect in your brain. Now taking control and magnifying everything to get you out of whatever it was. So here's how you use the five second rule. You use it to stabilize your thoughts before the panic escalates. And then what happens is it drifts into worry and then it disappears. Right. So the second you feel worry, you catch it, you train yourself to do that. If you start feeling yourself getting, you know, your heart racing, you can five, four, three, two, one and use the I'm excited, I'm excited. Um, if you, if that doesn't work, literally five, four, three, two, one, and just give yourself an anchor thought, literally, of you being okay. Hey, I'm Mel Robbins, and I wanted to make this video because, boy, has the interest in manifesting just skyrocketed. Do you know that there has been a 700% increase in Google searches for manifestation and manifesting techniques just this year alone? So if you're brand new to manifesting, you are in the right place because I'm gonna unpack the basics for you. I'm gonna help you understand this. And more importantly, I'm going to empower you to put this to use in your life to help you get what you want. And if you've been trying to manifest for a while now and it's not working, this is also an exceptionally awesome video for you to watch because it's probably going to reveal some of the mistakes you've been making. And so let's just jump into it. So here's what we're gonna cover in this video. First of all, I'm gonna give you a definition for manifesting that's gonna clear a lot of stuff up. Next, I'm gonna talk about what it is for real based on science and what it can help you do and what it isn't, how manifesting is very different than dreaming, hoping, wishing, and wanting, okay? Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about why this is a skill that you need. I'm gonna tell you a story about how some of the top performing athletes in the world at the highest level, Olympic levels are using the science of manifestation to get what they want when it comes to performing at their top level. I'm also gonna tell you a deeply personal story about how my husband and I used manifesting over 20 years ago to help us get this incredible dream house, this farmhouse that we always, always wanted outside of Boston, Massachusetts. And by the time that we are done with this, you're gonna feel so excited, so empowered because you're gonna know what manifesting is, you're gonna understand why you need it, and you are also going to be equipped to get started using it. All right. So let's start with the definition of manifesting. What the heck is manifesting, Mel Robbins? Well, let me tell you what manifesting isn't, okay? Manifesting is not thinking thoughts and then hoping that they come true. Thoughts become things only when your thoughts inspire you to take the actions to get those things. That's where manifesting comes in. Manifesting is preparing your mind, body, and spirit to help you take the actions to get those things. That's right, I'm gonna say that again. Manifesting is like training for getting what you want. Manifesting is socializing your mind, preparing your mind, rehearsing your mind to help you take the steps before you take the steps so that you can get what you want. When you use manifesting properly, what you do is you remove the obstacles of self-doubt, of resistance, of being cautious, of focusing on tiny minutia, of feeling blank and overwhelmed. You remove all that crap and you retrain your mind and you retrain your nervous system and you retrain your spirit to help you get the things that you want in life. And when you manifest properly, what it does is it inspires you to take the actions that lead you to what you want. Now that sounds like a lot of like, okay, Mel, what does that actually mean? What it means is this. Manifesting is going to help you see, feel, and act your way toward the things that you want. That's what it does. It's so freaking cool. Now let me tell you the difference between manifesting according to science and wishing, wanting, hoping, dreaming. Let's focus on sort of wishing. There's 
a lot of you that are confusing wishing for something with manifesting, okay? They're the opposite ends of the spectrum. And so before I kind of explain the two, let me just give you an example so that we can use the example to compare and to contrast, okay? One big goal and dream that a lot of people have is financial freedom. The ability to take your kids to Disney World, the ability to buy what you want, the ability to put enough money away so that you don't have to worry about money, the ability to buy the things that you need, to go on the trips that you want. Financial freedom is something that you deserve in your life. It's something that you can do the work to achieve in your life. And so let's talk about the goal of financial freedom and the difference between wishing for financial freedom and hoping and dreaming about it versus manifesting and doing the work to go get it. If you can hear my cat outside, you know that he sounds like he's dying. What he's actually doing is he's really pissed off because we have come into this little room and shut the door. And so he's walking around going, where are you? Where is everybody? Let's take a listen for a minute. So did you notice that wishing he would leave didn't work? What you're going to always get when you watch Mel Robbins videos is you're going to get the real deal, okay? But literally the real deal, because this is real life. And these are tools for real people to make real changes. And so you might as well see what's going on. So the cat is now sleeping on my lap and he's very happy. We were talking about financial freedom, which is a goal that so many people have, right? And what's the difference between you wanting and wishing for financial freedom and you manifesting it? and using manifestation and the science of it to help you get it. The big difference between wishing for something and using manifesting to help you do the work to go get it is that when you wish that you were financially free, have you ever noticed that the second that you wish for something, like, you know, I wish I would win the lottery, you're also present at the same time to the fact that you're lacking money right now. Like wishing that you would win the lottery, it doesn't bring up all of this sort of like empowering feelings. What it, what it does is it reminds you that you're so broke that you need to win the lottery. And that's very different than manifesting. Manifesting is declaring what you want. I am committed to creating financial freedom in my life. And then once you declare what you want, manifesting is about the actions and empowering yourself to go get it. And there's a really big difference between focusing on, you know, and wishing for something, which only reminds you that you're lacking it. You know, oh, I, I, I wish I would meet somebody. That just makes you feel more alone. I wish I could get in shape. That just makes you feel more out of shape. I wish I could win the lottery. That just makes you feel poorer. I wish I didn't have to work for this jerk. That just makes you feel more stuck. Do you feel how wishing for something amplifies what you don't like versus I'm going to manifest and work for more money in my life. I am committed to being in a loving relationship and I'm going to manifest and make it happen. I uh, deserve to have a career that I love and I'm going to use manifesting to help me get it. I want to be in incredible shape. I want to do a handstand in yoga. I want to heal my trauma and I'm going to use manifesting to help me achieve those things. That's a big difference. Wishing and hoping makes you present to what you don't have. Manifesting makes you present and feeling empowered about what you want and your ability to go get it. And that highlights the second big difference. When you hope for things, when you wish for things, you are handing the power to somebody else or to outside forces. You are literally giving away your power because hoping and wishing just inherently assumes that somebody else is somehow going to come in and solve the problem. We all know that that's not happening. Manifesting, on the other hand, locates and amplifies the power inside of you to do the work to get those things, to do the work to change your life. And it's important that you locate the power inside of you because you're the one that's responsible for your dreams and you're also the person that's in the best 
position to make those dreams a reality because you have the ability to change the way that you think. You have the ability to change the actions that you take every single day. And when you change the actions that you take and you change the way that you think, you change your entire life. And manifesting is a tool that will help you train your brain and train your nervous system and train your mind, body, and spirit to help you achieve the things that you want. The, the, the thing that's super important for you to get as a major takeaway from this video is the thoughts alone won't achieve the things that you desire. But if you manifest properly, it will inspire you to take action. And action is what will create the results that you deserve and that you want in your life. That's as simply as I can put it. I want to explain a little bit about the science. I promised you that I was going to quickly tell you a little bit about how some of the world's most successful athletes uh, are using the science of manifestation in order to win at the Olympics, in order to come back after an injury. You know, the U.S. Olympic team, there was a big article in the New York Times about this. They hire sports psychologists precisely for mental training. And what these sports psychologists are doing, there are five of them alone that work with the U.S. snowboarding and ski team. And what they do is they are doing the mental training with athletes before the Olympics to help them prepare to show up at the Olympics and absolutely crush it. And you're going to do the same thing. You are going to use manifestation to mentally prepare before and while you're doing the work to achieve your goals and dreams. Because when you mentally prepare, you remove all of the obstacles like self-doubt and nerves and anxiety and imposter syndrome and fear that are currently stopping you from taking action. And so how do you mentally prepare? Well, let me talk to you about the ski team because they do this super cool process that is basically what you do when you manifest. The sports psychologist would sit down with one of the gold medal winning skiers and snowboarders, particularly after injury, because if you think about it, somebody that's been injured during competition, even after they've had surgery and they've recovered, they're going to be nervous about competing again. And you may feel the same way about going for what you want. You may have faced a bunch of setbacks. You may have faced a bunch of disappointments. You may have faced a bunch of rejection. And so you're nervous about putting yourself out there. That's okay. Feeling nervous is normal, but you're not going to let it stop you. We're going to use manifestation to train your mind, body, and spirit to be able to do the work. We're going to rehearse what you need to do in your mind and your body and your spirit so that when it comes time to do it, you feel like you've actually already done it, which removes your nerves. It's so cool. So back to the U.S. Uh, ski and snowboarding team, the sports psychologists would sit with the athletes and, you know, let's just say, you know, the crazy snowboarding thing where they go off a jump and they do 50 million like hoops and loops and tricks and whatever. That's like a 10 second jump in the air. And so what the sports psychologist does is they have the snowboarder or the skier describe in detail, not the jump, but point A, point B, point C, point D, point E, point F, all the way to Z. Okay, I'm getting off the chairlift and I've got my uh, snowboard tucked under my right arm and I'm walking up to uh, the place where everybody's getting ready. And I, I hear the crunch, crunch, crunch of the snow and I, I feel the breeze. Do you notice I've got my eyes closed? I've got my eyes closed because I have made manifesting a habit. I do it every single morning. And when I start to manifest, I do something that I used to do as a trial lawyer, and that is put someone at the scene. Really good trial lawyers are able to put a jury right at a scene, right where it happened, with such detail that you can smell the cup of coffee on the counter. You can hear the cars passing outside. You can see the bright orange sweater that somebody's wearing right in your mind. You have the ability with your imagination to put yourself right at the scene. And that's exactly what these sports psychologists are coaching Olympic athletes to do. 
as you're standing there and the wind is blowing and your hat is on and they, they're calling your name. Now you're clipping in. Now you're feeling the excitement in your stomach. Now you're feeling yourself push off and you feel the momentum kick in and the gravity pull down and the speed increasing and you feel the lift off and you literally mentally rehearse visually and in your body feeling it. And what you're doing is you are preparing your body to be able to do it. Here's a cool fact about your brain. Your brain can't distinguish between real experiences that you've lived and the detailed experiences that you have imagined and felt through manifesting. So we are using your vision. We are using your ability to picture yourself there and feel yourself there as a way to prepare yourself to be there. And as you're seeing yourself doing all the work, I want you to feel this sense of pride and excitement in order to really imprint the step by step by step by step training in your mind, body, and spirit. All right, well, look, I'm no Olympic athlete, but I am a gold medalist when it comes to the science of manifestation. I used manifesting as a way to help me keep doing the work to find my dream house uh, outside of Boston. This is the story of how I use manifesting to do the work to find a needle in a haystack, which was an antique farmhouse outside of Boston. So God, uh, 1997, my husband, Chris, and I are newlyweds. We moved from New York City to the Boston area, and we have moved from New York to the Boston area because we know that we want to start a family. We know we don't want to be in New York City. We know we want to buy a house and have a yard. And so we rent an apartment in Cambridge, which is you know right next door to Boston. And for almost a year, we start looking for a house. Now, we were a really young newlywed couple. We did not have a lot of savings, and Boston, it's a really expensive real estate market. And so we looked at houses every single weekend for an entire year. And we either would go to these open houses and we just hated the neighborhood or we couldn't afford the house. And we were just feeling so discouraged. And it was about this time that I discovered the science of manifesting. And I luckily, didn't just learn thoughts become things. I learned the see it, feel it, and you'll believe it form of manifesting that you're learning right now. And here's what I would do. I would every single day, I knew what I wanted more than anything. I wanted to find an antique farmhouse with a big front porch. I wanted it to be in our budget. I wanted to have some land. I wanted to get a fixer upper. I just had this like this old house kind of vision in my mind, right? And I would sit there and I would think about Chris and I going to open houses. And I would think about uh, Chris and I seeing house after house. And I would think about Chris getting really discouraged. And I would feel the pressure of going to all these open houses and us not finding anything. And I could feel Chris getting discouraged and I could feel myself starting to get discouraged. And then I would feel and see myself turning to Chris and saying, Chris, you watch. We are really good people and we have the kind of luck that something magical is going to happen. We are going to find that needle in the haystack. I just know it. If we just keep going to open houses, if we just keep putting it out there that we're looking for an old farmhouse, a fixer upper with a big porch on a nice piece of property, we will find it. What this kind of manifesting does, where you see yourself pushing through the resignation, you feel yourself believing, you feel yourself doing the work to find that needle in the haystack, to beat the odds, to have something magical happens, is that you start to believe that it's going to happen. Through manifesting, I literally convinced myself that we would in fact find a needle in a haystack, that I didn't even need to worry about all the houses that we couldn't afford that we were seeing. I didn't even need to worry about the number of, of 
places that we would look at that were out of our range. I didn't even have to worry about how long it was going to take because I knew because I was aligning myself with what I wanted through proper manifestation that it would happen. I wasn't worried about the timeline. I just assumed that if we kept at it and we kept holding on for that needle in the haystack, amazing old farmhouse that one day somehow magically the stars would align, we would be in the right place and we would be rewarded because we had done the work and we had held out hope and we had kept on going. And why do we do those things? Because I had been training myself, preparing myself to do all those things. And I'll tell you what happened. About a year into looking in one of the nicest towns outside of Boston, Massachusetts, we got word that there was a ransack old farmhouse that may be coming on the market. So we drove out that weekend and we pulled up in front of the house. And I got to tell you, the grass at this house and the front yard was like waist high. Nobody had mowed this lawn in I don't know how many years. It looked like a field for crying out loud instead of a front lawn. The paint was all chipped. The house was this like ugly blue color. Most of the windows were broken. The only living beings inside the house were the family of raccoons who had taken up residence inside the chimney. The kitchen was so hideous, there was astroturf, indoor-outdoor grass, as the flooring in this house. Now, if I hadn't been manifesting, if I hadn't been training my mind, body, and spirit to see, feel, and believe that my husband and I would find this needle in a haystack, I would have turned to Chris the second we pulled up in front of this thing and said, are you kidding me? This dump? First of all, we won't be able to afford it. Secondly, this dump? What? Have we lost? It's not even on the market. Some developer is going to swoop in here in this neighborhood and pay three times what we can afford. There is no way we are going to get this. That's what would have happened if I hadn't been manifesting. Because the biggest obstacle to what you want is always your own self-doubt, your own excuses, your own fears, and your own stories. Because I had been manifesting, what it looked like and felt like to align my body and spirit with getting what I want, I stayed open that this could be that needle in the haystack. We got out of the car. We met with the owner. It turns out the house wasn't on the market yet. The family was figuring out what to do because the man who had owned it had just died incapacitated in a nursing home. None of the adult kids wanted the house. And what did they want for the house more than anything? This dilapidated old farmhouse that they had all grown up in? They wanted a young couple who was starting a family to raise their family in it. Well, the long and the short of it is that ugly old farmhouse with the broken windows and the raccoons inside and the indoor-outdoor grass turf for carpeting in the kitchen was that needle in the haystack. Chris and I bought it from the family before it ever came on the market. And we spent the first two years, honest to God, indoor camping inside of it. We didn't even have a kitchen. We had a Coleman two burner camping stove. <laughs> we did most of the renovations ourselves, which meant bringing the knob and tube wiring up to code, slapping on a paint of coat and bringing everything up to a point where it would be safe. And we have lived in this farmhouse and raised our family in it for the past 24 years. There is no way that I would have even gotten out of the car without having been manifesting for eight months prior to finding that farmhouse with the big wrap porch on a great piece of property right outside of Boston. It was seeing it, feeling it in my mind, body, and spirit that made my mind believe that it was possible. And when you believe that something is possible, you will do the work and you will stay open to all of the amazing possibilities that come into your life to make it happen. And here we are almost 25 years later, sitting here filming in that very house. So there you have it. I promised you that this would be a video that would be perfect if you're brand new to manifesting or if you've been manifesting for a while but it hasn't been working. I hope that now that you know the real definition and the real purpose 
of manifesting when you manifest using science and you manifest as a way to train and prepare your mind, body, and spirit to do the work to help you get what you want. I hope you now feel empowered and inspired to stop wishing and hoping for the things that you want in life and that you use manifesting to prepare yourself and inspire yourself to go take the action to make them a reality. Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for being here. If you enjoyed that video, by God, please subscribe because I don't want you to miss a thing. Thank you so much for being here. We've got so much amazing stuff coming. Thank you so much for sending this stuff to your friends and your family. I love you. We create these videos for you. So make sure you subscribe. Mwah.